Hello, everyone. So I'm seeing that we're live on Facebook. Mara, is that Effie behind you? So while oh, we're that is Medica Medicaten is here. Oh, Medicaten, <laughs> wonderful. So I'm showing that we're live on Facebook. Uh, while we are still settling in, I'm still going to give people a few more minutes to to find us who like to attend in real time. I want to offer you the invitation to use chat. Uh, you can put your introduction publicly in chat since this is a networking workshop. That's a good way for us to get a to chance to know about you and what you do and what you offer in the world. So if you can use the chat to let us know your name, perhaps where you're located at in the world today, and give your online presence a plug, right? If you have a website, share your website. If you have a social media handle that you put out there publicly, share it in, in the chat. Uh, especially at a networking workshop, I hope we're not bashful to share what we'd like to, to get out there about ourselves and what we bring to the conversation. So I'm reading a couple just, just off, off the top. Uh, and this is sometimes a nice way for us to see where we're all at in the world, right? So we have Lynn uh, from Ontario, California. I want to incorporate aquatics into expressive therapies and EMDR therapist. I think I may have met you at Andrea uh, and having that conversation. Oh, love that, love that. So we have Jill. Uh, from Long Beach, California. Jill's a consultee of mine uh, and uh, welcome offer unique healing strategies. Let's see, we have Anita Meyer, another former consultee of mine from Gig Harbor, Washington, liberating lives with EMDR.com. There's some stylist points in there. So please feel free to go through chat yourselves. And if you see any websites that interest you, uh, look them up, bookmark them for later. Uh, so we have Armira from Tirana in Albania. Welcome. Welcome for joining us. Uh, Mara, my assistant, I'll be introducing formally here in a moment. Uh, hi, Dr. Kelly. Dr. Kelly is one of my great collaborators and her website's here, drkellyk.com. Myra Kishanti, welcome so much. Uh, Myra and I took our yoga, te yoga teacher training together. Myra is in Jacksonville, uh, is a brilliant yoga nidra teacher, and she has her website posted. Hello, Katarina from Sweden. Uh, Katarina is also an expressive artist and does a lot with equine therapy. And she gave the plug to her center in, in Sweden here. So part of networking, my friends, we'll just get this started before we officially is uh, get rolling with the workshop is get your websites out there, especially in a forum like this where people ask you, share your websites, let us know where we can find you publicly. Please feel free to use the chat. And I'll teach you, if you don't know this about Zoom, especially with the setting that I have, you can save the chat. So people here in this workshop today are sharing their resources. I'd imagine there's a lot of people of like mind here in the workshop today. So down in the chat on Zoom, where you would type in for everybody, uh, there should be a little icon that has three dots on it and you can save the chat. And if you're watching this on Facebook and it'll be permanently available on Facebook, you can see what people are, are plugging in on Facebook. So we have Shay, a licensed social worker from Ohio. Shay put her website. Hi, Rebecca in Arizona. Rebecca is an early dancing mindfulness student of mine from Ohio, who's now out in Arizona. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit of this about what you want to bring to the conversation. I'm coaching and hopefully will launch the beginning of 2021, working with men and women ages 3 to 60 to help them to transform core beliefs through soul conversations and compassionate listening. A lot of great people in this group changing the world already, I can tell. So if you haven't yet, give yourself the plug in the chat. This is a big part of networking is getting used to doing that. So uh, Armira from, from Tirana uh, is a marketing expert, university lecturer, uh, put in her contact information. Hi, Sarah from Buffalo. She's an ICM Hello. consultant. Welcome, welcome. Uh, Deborah from, from Tampa, hello. Uh, I, another dancing mindfulness facilitator, welcome. Hi, Roshan, so nice to see you. And I see Russ Premdas there. So nice to see so many of my friends from Yoga World here in this, uh, in this workshop today, just lovely. So again, if you haven't yet picked up on our very first exercise we're doing, it's get used to giving yourself a plug. So that is what we're doing here in the chat and you are more than welcome to share this or to save this chat when we're done. So you can see what some other resources are. One thing Mara and I are going to be sharing is how a lot of networking is 
taking the risk to organically connect with people who you think, hey, we may either have a lot in common or our services seem complementary. Maybe we can work with each other. That's how Mara and I met. And that's how I've met with a lot of people who I work with collaboratively. I want to give a plug to my friend Russ Mobley's site, heartwalkin.com. Uh, it's, it's here in the chat. Russ is an amazing musician and yoga teacher and pilgrim in various different aspects of life. So we have Megan from Vienna, Virginia. Uh, Cindy, I run a women's retreat uh, for clean and sober women. The website is in the works, but it will be dropthorockohio.com. Great website. Wonderful. And let me just give a check here to make sure we're running on Facebook. Good. Looks like we got 12 folks joining us live on Facebook. So same thing on Facebook. If you want to give yourself a plug in the Facebook comments about where you're joining us from, uh, what you offer to the conversation, who you are in the world, what you bring, and feel free to give your website, your social media handles a plug. And we know that a lot of folks will be watching this later on the recording. So if, if you're sharing this, uh, yeah, they'll, they'll hopefully get a chance to see your resources too. So welcome everyone formally. Uh oh, somebody is screen sharing. Let me do one little technical thing here to make sure. Okay, that doesn't happen by accident. Yes, you're definitely willing, are able to share your material in the chat if you wish, but please avoid actually screen sharing or uh, unmuting yourself unless you might have a question later and you're, you're called to, to speak. So before we formally get started, I'd like to invite everyone to uh, take a stretch. Just a nice organic stretch. Mm, taking a few seconds to wiggle and squirm the body mm, in whatever way may help you to settle in for our next few hours together. And I also want to let you know you have complete permission to move during this. I'll, I'll be sitting and kind of riffing, uh, yet if you are dancing on the other end or wiggling on the other end, I honor it. <laughs> and if you need to take breaks during this time, go ahead and do it organically. So this is a topic that I have written about quite a bit. I've consulted about it quite a bit, but you are my first group that I'm testing actually doing a workshop with on this. And it's very informal, very chill. It's largely me sharing what in 12-step recovery would say is my experience, strength and hope about what I have found has worked in the way of, of networking. And one of the things we'll cover right off the bat is what the difference is between networking and marketing. What's the difference between networking and marketing? So again, chat is open. If you wanna to continue to share a little bit about who you are, what you do, uh, drop your website or social media presence, you're welcome to do that. And I'd like to bring in my assistant for the day, Mara Tesler Stein, who is a faculty member with the Institute for Creative Mindfulness. Mara will be monitoring the chat because when I'm in a flow here of uh, talking, uh, I'm not really looking at the chat unless I ask a question of you and I might get some participation going through chat. But Mara knows how I would answer a lot of these questions. So you're in good hands with Mara. And I've also brought her in and I'll bring her in a couple times uh, during the workshop to share what she has found works for her. So Mara, why don't you give us the pitch about who you are, what you do, what you bring to the world, and what your general philosophy is about networking. Okay, thanks, Jamie. Um, so I am, my name is Mara Tesla Stein, and I live in Chicago. Um, for me, it was such a pleasure to be invited to this because I do think that Jamie and I are very simpatico on how we think about this. I really think about all of this networking is really relationship building. And that when you can allow yourself, this is how I see it myself anyway, by allowing myself to be excited and enthusiastic and curious about other people and the work that they're doing and to notice the ways in which what they do and what I do may intersect or interlock in some way. It opens up all kinds of possibilities for introductions. And some of the most profound 
experiences, opportunities, and more, most importantly, I would say some of my closest relationships and friendships have actually come about because I made a phone call or sent an email and said, I just want to let you know how your work has affected me. I just want to tell you what it means to me and how it has is, is influenced what I do. And so the, the, the ability to sort of say, um, I'm here and I see you and I really appreciate you is, is a way to just begin to connect with people. So from my perspective, that's what it's really all about. Um, and, and you can feel the difference when somebody approaches you that way. So my philosophy is think about connection. Um, think about letting people know the impact that they've had on you. I could, I could, I could riff all, all, all morning on this. So mm -hmm. I know that I'll have an opportunity and Jamie and I will have an opportunity to say more. Um, I guess the only other little nugget I wanna drop that we can talk more about over, over the course of this workshop is the generosity Mm -hmm. is also a, a core philosophy yes. um, when, when offering writing or speaking or brief consultation to, to put out in the world what you wish the world would have more of. Yes. Mara, I just want to check. Are you still hearing me? Okay. I am hearing you. Great. I, I, switched, I switched my microphone over. And okay. one of the first uh, points that I want to emphasize and what I want to share with you today is this idea of connection at taking risks, having conversation as often the first step. Mara practices what she preaches. The way she and I met was she sent me a Facebook message. This was years ago when she was still amassing consultation hours for her, even her, I think it was just your certification at that point. And yeah, CIT, I you, think, yeah. yeah, you were following me online and said, hey, can I pop in one of your groups? And, and you did. And, oh, and then it was yeah. a little while later that I, that I heard from you again. And it was just through those conversations that I, I developed, it's like, yeah, Mara and I do, you know, can work well together. And Mara is now a member of the ICM faculty and we are working towards doing a lot of other things collaboratively. A uh, couple other people I wanna shout out that they're on this call, Anna Perkle, Amy Wagner, uh, also collaborators of mine. Anna is writing a book with me now. Amy and I have done a lot with dissociative consultation groups and our connection started the same way. They, uh, Anna left me a voicemail after hearing me on a podcast. Amy connected with me on social media after seeing some of my work, sent me messages. And, and a lot of times these conversa these connections aren't instantaneous necessarily because like Mara and I, um, it, it wasn't right away we started working together, but through those initial conversations, we, we now end up working together. And uh, some of you, if you have followed my work, know the famous story of Steve Danziger and I. Steven is uh, another ICM senior faculty member. He and I have written three books together and we're working on our fourth. And it literally started as he sent me an email. He read Trauma in the 12 Steps, the first edition, and really kind of liked what, what we were doing, uh, what I was doing with, with the work, sent me an email basically saying, I have to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> and so he likes to tease that he stalked me, uh, but it was a healthy stalking relationship. And we now work together and collaborate together. And I, I don't want to make promises that all of these connections are necessarily going to work out because I've had people connect with me and, and I've enjoyed maybe having social media level contact with them, but it, it's not necessarily the best fit of partnership, but I still get a chance to like and know what you do. And if it seems like someone else may be a better fit to connect with you, I'm that type of person where I will connect you. I think some of the greatest pride I have on my, in my work is looking to see how people I've connected with each other <laughs> have ended totally. up doing, doing work together. And sometimes people, you will reach out to people and you'll get a no or you'll get a no answer. And something we'll be talking about a little later in the course specifically is there is a part of this work being a public person, being a thinker, being a mover and a shaker, where you will have to get used to being told no or getting no answer. And yeah, I mean, I've had to do a couple therapy sessions around that. 
doesn't mean uh, what I have to offer is, is not valuable. I think many of us know the story of how many amazing artists that we love and admire. I'm talking Bruce Springsteen, Bob Dylan level people got something like 75 rejection letters uh, from publishers before uh, people actually picked up on their work. So uh, I think uh, that's an immediate piece of advice I would have right off the bat is just get, get, it, get used to being told no or not getting an answer. So Mara, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say, I have, I have a story like Jamie's about uh, a connection and, and a risk taken that was 20, it's gonna be 24 years ago um, when my preemie babies had just come home and I wanted very much to write a book for parents of premature babies. And the only book that I found that even closely resembled what I wanted to do was a book written for parents who, whose babies had died. And through a completely, I mean, it's almost like heaven sent kind of uh, connection. I got, I got put in touch with the author of that book and I called her and I just wanted to let her know how powerful her book was that I had a pile of books and hers was the only one I bought. And to ask her advice, how do you get a book like this that's so emotionally evocative published? By the end of the conversation, she suggested that we collaborate. Mm -hmm. uh, 24 years later, it feels like we were made to write together and our dear, dear, dear friends. And she said to me just the other day, because we're working on a, a book chapter, actually, she said, I knew when you called me that you didn't want anything from me. Mm -hmm. You were just calling to tell me the impact of my work, to ask my advice. There was no sense of like, that there was some string here mm -hmm. attached. And, that, and that's absolutely true in terms of how I felt. And so I share that as, as a way of saying what I was saying earlier, that um, that heartfelt phone call or email, the intentions come through. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and, and I think sometimes, I, I mean, I'm already getting so many ideas just talking to you. Uh, and and I, I mean, I don't know how big my influence really is. I mean, compared to Brene Brown, it's minuscule, but it, it's significant, wow. you know, in a lot of other circles, right? Uh, and a lot of times people will send me emails saying, I, I don't think this will ever get to you. And sometimes Mary and Alicia do a lot of vetting for me here in the office because we do get a high volume of emails, but they, they do send quite a bit through directly. And if you're connected with me on social media, I still get what a lot of people send me directly. And it, I'll, I'll say, at least for people like Mara and I, who, who want to maintain the integrity of networking, it means a lot. So don't be afraid to reach out just to tell people what their work has meant to you. Uh, they may or may not see it yet, like Mara has shared, who, who knows what's going to happen. So Mara, thank you so much for being here today. The reason I really invited Mara as my assistant for this today is she's doing this, she's living this, and if, even in her contributions, you're going to get a lot of great experience, strength, and hope. So, all right. Uh, as a reminder, before I tell you a little bit about my story and how I found the difference between marketing and networking, is the chat is open throughout the training. Feel free to plug your stuff, share your things, uh, put your questions in chat. Mara will likely answer a lot of them, yet if there's something when I bring her in, she feels she would like me to answer directly, Mara, I'll have you go ahead and, and ask, ask that question of me. So one of the reasons I wanted to put this workshop together, and it's a reason I put an article together two years ago uh, from which this workshop evolved, is that I get the, the, the comment all the time, Jamie, you're such a good marketer. I'm really not. I don't believe I am. There, there's a difference between marketing and networking. I do believe I am a good networker. So let's do a little participation right off the bat. Using chat, either on Facebook or here in the Zoom room, just, just put a couple lines about what you see as the difference between networking and marketing. And for those of you who are joining us on Facebook Live, I did put the Zoom link in the comments. I will put it again. Uh, we're not full here in the Zoom room. So if you'd like to come into the Zoom room, you may have a little bit more interaction with the chat. You'll be able to save the chat here on Zoom. Uh, so CP uh, has, has chimed in here. Networking relationships, marketing agenda. 
I like that. It's, it's simple and it's a very powerful distinction right away. So networking relationships, marketing agenda. Sarah says marketing is more about selling myself and networking is connecting. Very nice. Katerina says networking is about connection. Marketing is about selling. Uh, Roshan says networking more interpersonal gatherings in person or not. Jetsa says networking is about connection. Marketing is a strategy to sell. Yeah, and we're getting a lot of uh, similar content on that. Uh, Gramster adds networking is two way. Mm -hmm. Networking is connection. Networking is more personal. Networking is collaborating. Yes. So I, I want to be very clear about not disparaging what marketing people do because I do think there's a value to marketing, especially in certain businesses, most definitely. Uh, I, I'm not gonna lie and say I haven't done any marketing over the years, because I certainly have put some money into marketing. Yet my overall experience has been that I have not gotten a very great return when I've put money into marketing. I've done consults with, with high level marketers. I've done consults. And honestly, we've, Mary and I, Mary's the COO, we've gotten more out of doing consults with who I'd say are more organic mid level marketers to work with smaller businesses because they understand that there is an element of networking and marketing. And some of you know my teaching that there's a difference between a facilitator and a teacher, right? that a facilitator shares of their practice, a teacher is actually instructing something. And yes, good teachers need to draw on some facilitating and facilitators may need to pick up on some teaching strategies from time to time. So I am not totally against spending money on marketing. I'm not totally against talking to professionals who may know better. All I am saying and truly anything I'm saying today is simply my experience but I feel it's a valuable experience to offer because a lot of people have asked me, like lots of people have asked me over the years how I do it, how I've built my Jamie Marriage brand, how I've built the Institute for Creative Mindfulness brand. And it honestly all started, if I had to trace the genesis of where I started to where I am now. So for those of you who don't know the story, I'll just review it briefly, that uh, I'm a professional clinical counselor. That's my primary professional vocation. And I got into that field totally through the back door. I, I was a teacher and an educator and a performing artist to start with. And I was working in humanitarian aid for three years after the, uh, the, the, the war has three different names, depending on who you ask. The, the Yugoslav civil war is what I typically call it in, in the early 90s. And I was working in Bosnia and Croatia in the early 2000s. And that is when uh, I met my first mentor who said, be a counselor, you'd be good at it. And I said, no. And she said, trust me. And here she was right. And I really did like professional clinical counseling off the bat, but I found that I still missed being a teacher. And that if I was only going to do clinical counseling, my teacher soul would be snuffed out and that was not okay with me. And so my initial intention on how to stretch my teaching muscle was to go back and get a PhD. And I'm di I did, and I'm glad I did it, but my sense was I was going to teach university level instruction, and that was the way I was going to be a teacher. And then something magical happened. In 2007, I offered a three-hour lunch and learn for the employees at the outpatient agency I was working at at the time. I was recently uh, certified in EMDR therapy, uh, having gone through the whole training, and my clinical director at the time said, yeah, we know you can't train us in EMDR, but can you at least teach us about what you're doing with EMDR so that people can refer folks to you? And I said, well, yeah, because a big part of what we were covering in my doctorate program was how to do presentations, you know, PowerPoints and all of that. And I'd put together a EMDR 101 PowerPoint. And so I gave this kind of two hour lunch and learn, right? On a, uh, on a topic that was very important to me. And one of my colleagues, actually many of my colleagues, but one in particular said, where did you learn how to talk like that? And I laughed saying, I've been on stage my whole life. 
it's it's just something that's so second nature. I've been performing since I was three. Uh, additionally, I was also a high school speech and debate coach at a couple different times in my life. So I've taught other people how to do public speaking as well. And he said, you know, people pay money for you to do continuing education courses. I had no idea. I, I had known what CEs were, but I assumed that this was just people either volunteering their time or it was other professors who, who was doing them. And he said, you can be a CE presenter. And he immediately gave me the contact of the person who was running education at the time for the uh, Cleveland Adams Board, Drug and Alcohol Mental Health Services Board. And at that time they had a pretty extensive training institute. And he said, they would hire you, I know they would. <laughs> and so look at my face. Cause I, I was literally like, I, okay. I was what, like 27 at the time. And I sent them a proposal for like the little three hour intro to EMDR course. And he said, think about some other things you, you might like to talk about. And I asked them what they needed in the way of proposals. And I wrote up a proposal and it took a couple months to get everything in order. But then they started hiring me. And that's when I really learned, wow, you, you can get paid money to teach this way. And this is so much more organic to how I want to teach. Because like I'm not disparaging marketers, I'm not disparaging university professors. <laughs> Yet it became very clear to me over the years that this is not where I belong. And I much rather would rather teach other professionals and other people in the community than necessarily being tied to a university. And some people do both and do both well. I adjunct for a while and did both well for a while, but it, it eventually I knew my intention was to not be tied to university for teaching, that I wanted to be able to be independent with it. So after, and, and Rick Sosi was my colleague's name who did that. And I, I still give him credit every time I see him, like everything I have today is because you told me that. And it got this idea in my head, well, if the Cleveland Adams Board will pay for trainings, I wonder who else will pay for trainings. And it was 2008, I could still see it in my head in the basement of my condo that I was living at the time, I was working on my doctorate. So I was on the computer constantly. And I said, oh, why not spend a few more hours on the computer? And every night I would do Google searching to see kind of what independent organizations are offering continuing education trainings or what organizations might hire somebody to do continuing education. And I think in those first two to three months of 2008, I probably sent out 500 emails. I don't have an exact statistic, but I think I got six answers back to those 500 emails. And that's why I'm here today. I traced the genesis of Jamie Marich as a trainer, Jamie Marich as an author, the Institute for Creative Mindfulness, which a lot of you are familiar with and affiliated with in some way or have studied with in some way. And so, yeah, the Adams Board hired me, hired me a couple other treatment centers started to hire me. And then at the time, uh, another organization that hired me was called CMI education. And they had some concerns about the fact that, well, you do seem young, but you also seem like you know your stuff in terms of bridging practice with, with, with clinical work. And one of the companies, well, I'll, I'll, I'm jumping ahead of myself. CMI eventually ended up getting absorbed by PESI. And a lot of you in the helping professions know who PESI is. I mean, whether you like them or hate them, they're a huge provider of continuing education courses now. So even though CMI was rather small and willing to take a chance on me, once they got absorbed by PESI in 2010, then I started getting gigs nationally for PESI. And uh, two of my first three books that I wrote, PESI Publishing ended up putting them out. I will also talk a little bit about the writing angle too at some point during this. Because a lot of people who come to me and ask questions can automatically assume that writing the book gets you famous or writing the book gets you known, it's actually more often the other way around, uh, particularly in modern times that getting yourself known first really has to be the forerunner to being able to have someone else have faith in your writing. Uh, and, and the other element of that too is I believe that I'm able to write the way I do 
because I teach so much. And it's not just I'm sitting down to write like a college paper or a clinical textbook that so much of, of the networking spirit that I'm able to convey does come out in, in how I write. So kind of continuing the story through, even as I was working for PESI, I, was, I still had a pretty substantial clinical practice. I was still uh, doing some adjuncting work because I'd gotten my PhD at that time. Uh, as I worked for PESI, going all over the country, doing courses, I met other people. So I met Melita Travis Johnson, who's another member of our community and ICM that's very dear to me. She came to a PESI course. A lot of people I know now came to PESI courses and PESI was also very good. And this is another little tip I wanna give for all of you. Uh, putting your email list out. So even though they were hiring me to, to teach a course for them and to make money for them, I got permission, am I able to put out, sign up for Jamie Marriage's email list? I know some of us have a love-hate relationship with emails. <laughs> I know I certainly do. And honestly, I don't subscribe to very many people's networks anymore just because my email box is so clogged. But something I learned in studying marketing and networking is if you put out sign up for Jamie Marich's email list, people are actually asking to receive emails if they sign up. And some will ask you, are you going to clog my box? And, and I'll answer, honestly, we send out about two a month, two a month, three a month. And I, I will say it has had returns for me sending out those e-blasts. Uh, so if you don't have an email list, consider getting one. And anytime you do an event, and I know it's, uh, it's COVID, so a lot of us may not be doing live events, but even if you do an event like this online, uh, make sure that people know how to find you afterwards. And then on your websites, and this is something that was recommended to me, have a place where people can sign up for your email list. I know a lot of the success we have in courses that we offer getting registrations are from sending out our emails. And so I'm very grateful to PESI that they were willing to let me put out my, hey, sign up for Jamie's email. Because uh, what's weird is after that process, I, I no longer really needed PESI because I was able to offer my own courses, especially in EMDR training. And uh, that's where the Institute for Creative Mindfulness is born. Uh, it, it officially came to be in 2015, although I was doing some level of independent training uh, from as early as 2007, 2008, when, when I told you that story. So I, I just believe very powerfully in the, in the power of organic connections. And I do think there can be a connection between having confidence in what you do, having confidence in what you do, what you offer, and being able to send that email and say, hey, this is what I do. Is it a good fit for your organization? Some of your networking might be like Mara. And I said, it, it just starts with, hey, I'd like to meet you. I'd like to know you. And from there, things can, can balloon and snowball. But I remember when, when Anna reached out to me uh, a couple of years ago now, I was just so overwhelmed because Anna sending me a message and a contact was, was somebody doing for me what I've often done with other people, just send out the message or the contact. And it just filled me with this sense of, you know, if you're thinking, oh, should I make the call? Shouldn't I? Should I send the email? Shouldn't I? Send it. Make the call. You never know what's going to happen for it from it. And it's, it's better to, to do that and get a, a no or a no answer, I think, than, uh, than to be in regret about, you know, maybe I should have reached out, maybe I shouldn't have reached out. So a couple other just general personal philosophies that I have about networking uh, is that I will try anything once. So I'm a recovering addict and that, that logic uh, was what fueled me in my addiction, right? I'll try anything once. In active recovery, I, I have a lot of that same belief too. Like I will try anything once. If somebody says, hey, would you like to do this workshop for us? And obviously now that I'm more established, I can be a little choosier about what I take and what I don't take in terms of offers. But I will tell you this, Tamara's point about generosity. 
And I know this is an area of potential controversy because on one hand, I don't think we should undersell ourselves and be willing to give away everything for free. But I will tell you this, even at my level, as somebody who purely makes her living educating others, writing for others, making my living off of that, creating employment for others, I will still do stuff for free. And a lot of that is just like today. I mean, a lot of that's just my value system that I do want to give back. And I do believe in the law of return. And that comes back to you. But some of the best connections that I have been able to make are through free events. And generally, conferences can be part of that in the professional field. Unless you're an invited presenter, you're usually paying to go to a conference. But again, some of the best connections I've made that have yielded to paid work have come from conferences. So everybody has to establish their kind of personal ethic here on what they're willing to do, what they're not willing to do. Uh, so as I said, part of mine is I'll try anything once. And after trying anything once, if it feels like this is a good relationship I wanna cultivate, I'll keep cultivating it. If it feels like mm, it was not worth the money for the amount of energy I had to put in, then I, I won't continue with the relationship. And that was also something I believe I read in a word of mouth marketing book early on. Uh, and, and a plug I wanna give is Word of Mouth Marketing by Andy Cernovitz. Uh, Mara, if you can look it up on Amazon and put it in or a book site and put it in the chat, Word of Mouth Marketing by Andy Cernovitz. It, it was so helpful to me when I began this process of being a more public figure. And he really broke down this idea that modern world, especially internet and email and everything we do on social media has returned has returned us to the marketplace of medieval times, if you will, that rep recommendations, reputation, how, whether that's a blessing or a curse, it is what we're working with right now. And I will be talking a little bit and answering your questions about how you can leverage social media to work for you. Because I certainly started this journey before social media was anything that was significant in my life. I think I had a Facebook account in 2006. I checked maybe four times a year. And now Facebook is really so vital to, to what I do in connecting. So also as part of your personal ethic here is what are you willing to do for free? What feels worth it to do for free, especially because of connections that you might make? And honestly, there's some events I still do where, I've, where I'll give an hour or two of my time. And it feeds my soul so much more than something I might get paid a thousand dollars for. So these are, are the kind of questions that you have to ask yourself, but it's all kind of wrapped up in this, am I willing to be adventurous and try anything once? And again, that was a philosophy I took early on. And from that, a lot of this has flowed. So Something in this vein I'd like you all to consider right now, and any of my yoga friends in here know where I'm going with this, is what is the difference between an intention versus a goal? Again, if you want to use the chat to, to, to weigh in on that, what is the difference between an intention versus a goal? Because in terms of deciding, what am I willing to do? How... Am I willing to try anything once? What is it I want to offer to the world? A lot of that is being able to craft an intention for yourself. So we have Pasha saying, hi, Pasha, nice to see you. Intention is more heart-centered. Stacy, uh, goals are what you expect for an outcome. Intention is how you do it. I think that's part of it for sure, that a lot of it is loving the process instead of the product. As expressive arts people, we emphasize that all the time, that if you obsess too much on the end product and don't enjoy the process, you're A, probably gonna get resentful if the end product that you want doesn't work out. And a lot may be revealed in the process. A lot may be revealed in the process. 
uh, in, uh, uh, Felicia is saying intention is about how to start. The goal is the end. Uh, Russ is saying intention is a direction. It's it's the direction you're setting, whereas a goal may be more, more uh, measurable. Anna says intention is an internalized step towards the goal. Intention is your spirited vision. Intention is living in meaning. And goal is growth or direction. Uh, oh, uh, Rafis, this is great. Intentions do not micromanage the goal outcomes. <gasps> Preach. I love that. Uh, intention is your deep hope and goals evolve and change. Yep. Sarah says a goal is time concrete, time limited, result oriented. Intention is a way of connecting with my heart and as such can change. Sure. These are all great and, and certainly keep them going. So even before I really dove into to studying yoga and meditation, I, I didn't like the word goal that much because I, I grew up a, as a quasi athlete and everybody was so goal, 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 goal. What are your goals? What are your goals? And, and just like, I don't think marketing's bad or college professionals are bad. I don't think goals are bad either, particularly if you are an athlete and the goal really helps to motivate you. But I do think goals can let you down. If your deep vision in your head is this is what I will do. And yeah, some people are able to do that and it gets them there. But in my experience, especially working with a lot of trauma survivors and addicted individuals, we can easily get disheartened when we don't see our goals manifesting or when we don't see our goals coming to be. And so uh, citing one of, one of my teachers, uh, Dr. Kamini Desai, who I trained in with, uh, trained with in Yoga Nidra, uh, intention is more reality friendly. Intention allows for things may change. Intention allows for, I, mess, I may mess up for a couple of weeks, but that doesn't mean it's all for lost. So how I've long defined intention, and this is drawing on examples of some of my other teachers through the years in yoga and meditation, and intention is the seed you plant. This is what I would like to do. This is how I see myself making a difference in the world. So also to keep this more participative, using the chat, because I love what I'm getting in chat, how can you articulate your vision for yourself using more of that language of intention, as opposed to by next year, I will make $40,000 selling my program or by next year, I will get 800 people to book me. So think about as Mara and I asked you at the beginning, what is it that you bring to the conversation? What is the kind of work you envision yourself doing in the world, the, the, the world work that really sustains your heart? And how might you articulate that for us in the language of intention, as opposed to the language of hard and fast goal? So I'll give you a, a little bit of time to reflect on that. Mara, I'm going to bring you in. And just for a little difference of perspective here, can you share with me some of your thoughts about intention versus goal? All right. Um, yeah, I think that I, I was just actually going to enter this in the chat as I'm reflecting on it. I think that for me, intention is about what I would like to leave behind the ways in which I would like my presence to have or and and or what I've done, what I've taught, how I've done what I've done mm -hmm. to have mattered or made a difference or left some meaningful remnant that then gets picked up and taken by somebody else, having put people together, which I also do a lot, Jamie. I always joke, I'm a connector. Mm -hmm. um, and then the goal, goals, I actually don't, think about goals. Um, I think of, for me, goals are like, I need to get this thing done mm -hmm. in time for this thing that has to happen. Mm -hmm. um, because the goals are for me so organic and, and so um, just automatically connected to the intention. Mm -hmm. So for example, when I reached out to Debbie Davis 24 years ago, 
my intention was not to collaborate on a book. I would never have thought about mm -hmm. collaborating on a book. And part of the joke we have is I said to her, well, we should be able to knock this out in about 18 months, right? Huh, <laughs> seven, seven years. Mm -hmm. Seven years is what it takes to write one of these books. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's also a process of, um, that's why I said earlier in the chat, goals evolve. Mm -hmm. And, and I tend to think more about um, impact and influence and, and who I get to meet and play with along the way. Mm -hmm. Because that's the other thing. If it's not fun, not every second of every bit of what you have to do is fun to get there. But mm -hmm. I'll tell you something, if it isn't fun, something's wrong. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. So uh, a couple of folks uh, are sharing their intention language. Anna says, by next year, I'm going to meet. Oh, that's Adelina. By next year, I'm going to meet you in person. <laughs> and I'm sure oh, that will be there. Uh, that's kind of goal I can get behind. Different. Yep. <laughs> and Anna says, by next year, I will launch my love of jujitsu in the written world. Mm. That's happening, Anna. <laughs> most, most definitely. Uh, Rafi says, I want to create safe space for those grieving the sudden loss of a mm. loved one and to share tools mm. for others to heal safely, especially for those experiencing the pain and isolation. Um, my ten, yes, my intention is to spread my work from my perspective. Yes, uh, my intention is to help each person I work with see possibility, accept the reality. Yes, uh, Russ says my intention is to inspire everyone I meet to live from their heart in a way to help them discover my true self. Keep them coming. This is good stuff. Mara, go for I, it. I have something to add here, and I'm so it's something um, that was said here reminded me. This is something that I learned from Debbie Debbie Davis early on. For anybody who's hesitating to say, well, what am I adding? Mm. There's so many people doing this work. What, who needs me in particular? Mm -hmm. you know, doesn't it have to be somehow better or different? So what Debbie has said all along, and I now believe it, uh, truly believe it, nobody will do the thing that you do the way that you do it. Nobody will write about disenfranchised grief, as someone talked about, the mm -hmm. way you will. Mm -hmm. Nobody will teach on this topic and connect it to this other topic the way that you will. Mm -hmm. So I just encourage you to believe that you bring your own spice and ingredients to what you do and how you do it and to trust in that. There's mm -hmm. room for everybody. Yeah. And we will circle back to trusting in yourself again, but I'm glad you put it out here right now. And I, and, I, and that's another value I really hold strong, that there is room for everybody. Here is, before I give you probably one of the top five pieces of advice I'm going to give you today, in my opinion anyway, I did put in the chat, both on Facebook and here in Zoom, the article on which this kind of workshop we're doing today is based, because I don't have a handout for this. I don't do a PowerPoint for this. I am mostly testing out some of this today. And we'll just have, have a conversation. I think so many of us are PowerPointed to death. So you can, you can read the article, right? if you wanna have more of a handout review of, of what we're doing today. Part of intention, setting a, a broader intention, planting a, a seed instead of having a hard and fast goal is it can really limit your vision. Some people may not like what I'm about to say Yet it's something that has worked for me tremendously. Listen to what people are asking for. Listen to what people are asking for. Because sometimes you can be so, well, this is what I want to do. This is the coaching program I want to launch. This is what I want to teach. This is what I want to write, et cetera, et cetera. And honestly, there have been times I've launched courses that I think are fantastic ideas and they kind of dud, which is okay. I already told you I'll try anything once. Uh, fun fact, I never, and I use that word, I never thought I'd be an EMDR trainer. And I know some of you are laughing right now because you've trained with me or you, you work with me. Uh, when I was setting out in this work as a continuing educator, I was so put off by kind of the technical quality of what it took to be an EMDR trainer, I said, I'm never gonna do it. I'll train on trauma, I'll train on addiction, I'll train on mindfulness, but I am never gonna be an EMDR trainer. And you know what? People kept asking me, Jamie, when are you gonna train an EMDR? 
When are you going to train an EMDR? When you become an EMDR trainer, then I'll take it. When I was doing these PESI courses I talked about and people would sign up on my things, they'll say, contact me when you become an EMDR trainer. And it's not a matter of, well, one person asks for it, so I'm going to drop everything and do it. But I had about 40 people ask me over the course of a year. And I, I'm one who's pretty, you could say it's connection to God, the universe, I pray, I ask for guidance. And that's a pretty big sign, <laughs> wouldn't you say? That when people start asking, when are you going to do this? Listen to that. Because I think that can also help and, and craft your vision. Some people may think of that as market research, like listening to what the needs are out there, as opposed to what you think the needs are. And very often there's a collapse, they, they will meet up at some point for sure. Uh, because I, I've ended up really enjoying teaching EMDR and I've learned that there's a way that I can teach EMDR and still be myself which is what I knew I needed to do to be ordered, ordered to be an EMDR trainer. And it, it grew and it evolved. So yeah, I'm curious to get some of your take on that. You can use the chat. Does that feel scary to you? What I just said, listen to what people are asking for. Does it feel like it's rubbing up against or running in conflict to what your passions may be? Or does it feel like there's room for both? where you can set the intention of this is how I'd like to share my passion in the world, but keeping an open mind and an open heart to what's needed in the world. Amy, <laughs> I, I'm gonna read this because I love what you said here. I never thought I'd be on the road to being an EMDR trainer until Jamie came into my life. It was a Facebook message and voila, here we are. I just reflected on how uh, my connection and collaboration with Jamie brings so much joy to my career. Oh, thank you so much, Amy. The feeling is, is mutual. Yeah, and so Katerina, thanks for this reflection that, that it's not scary. What I want to give is also about the receiver. People are where they are. Yep, it's, it's one of my mantras. And so it could be, a lot of us as clinicians know this logic of meeting people where they're at that listening to what people are asking for is a big part of that. So Russ says the universe, reality, God, truth shows us what we need, not what we want. And it's okay to live with intention and have goals. Yeah, it, it is It is a both and. So Stacy says it doesn't feel necessarily scary, more so smacking my head. And of course we, we do that every day in, in session. Yeah, uh, so, so this is um, something I really want you to consider. What are people asking for? And this might be an assignment that I will leave you with when you follow up from this course today. Consider going on your social media presence and we'll be more specifically talking to social media here in a minute. And maybe just as a status asking, what would you like to hear from me? Knowing what you know about me, what would you like to see me teach? What would you like to see me offer? I still do that in statuses in my groups. Uh, when I launched the free webinar series here uh, for telehealth and therapists at the beginning of, of COVID in my EMDR training group, I put it up as a post, like, would you come and take this? Does this sound like a good idea? And people gave me feedback on what they would come to, what they wouldn't come to. So really, really listen to, to what people are asking for, because it, it might open up another dynamic of this, another dynamic of this. Okay, so how do you let people know what you're doing and what you're offering? Let's go there next. As Mara said in one of the chat comments, she was letting people know what she does and what she offers long before social media was a thing. And for many of us who came up as clinical professors, professionals, it was largely conferences that helped us to do this, having conversations over dinner at events during sessions. And for those of you who do go to live conferences in your field, uh, maybe it's classes or workshops at, at the ashram or, or other yoga institutes, uh, one day I believe we will be doing this again <laughs> once, once the pandemic passes. 
Uh, and this is where it can be an edge for those of you who may identify as a little more introverted or maybe have some blocks around, but what I have to do isn't special. Yes, there is a fine line between being prideful and arrogant and well, this, you know, me, 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 because I think that turns off people too. But going to the point about how networking is a two-way street, some of the best conversations I've had with people at conferences, at the yoga institutes, et cetera, et cetera, is you truly have this, this desire to get to know another person, have a conversation. And so much of networking is willingness to have a conversation. Because I like whoever said marketing kind of is an agenda. I can tell when people are coming at me with an agenda. Like, this is what I do. I'm trying to sell you on this versus people who come at me with just good people skills. We want to have a conversation. We, we want to get to know each other, right? Mara brought up the list serve, which I can find list serves maddening. Uh, but a lot of us who are professionals are on list serves and that, that makes it worth it. I, another story I'll tell you all about a list serve. So the Ohio Counseling Association, it's like a 90 or $100 membership a year. It is worth it to me just for the listserv, that $90 to $100 membership. So that's one of the places where I will spend a little bit of money on marketing, right? Uh, because yeah, you can put out any of your trainings that you do on this listserv. They welcome it. They don't forbid it. And we get a lot of Ohio-based trainees from that listserv. So if the membership fee feels like it, it's worth it because it contains your access to a listserv, and they let you promote what you do on a listserv. And there's even ways on listservs or in social media groups where you can promote who you are and what you do without being so obnoxious about it. And here's another big point I wanna make. And this is whether you're on a listserv, social media, newsletters. If you just promote what you do, in the way of events, services, this is what I wanna sell you, it's going to fall flat. And this is a big tip I learned from Andy Cernovitz and Mark Schaefer, who's another writer that talks about social media marketing, that I see some people, even some people who are close to me, they have professional Facebook pages, professional Twitters, and all they post is, this is these are my events. These are my events, or these are my products. You may get some sales that way, but that's usually off-putting to people if all you're doing is promoting your events, promoting your stuff. So there's a saying in, in social media marketing that context is, I'm sorry, content is king. Content is king. So if you are going to have a social media presence, and we'll talk here in a minute about the advantages of a personal social media presence versus a professional social media presence, because for people at our level, you may actually get better engagement at a personal uh, social media presence level, right? But part of what is meant by content is king is are you willing to do things like share articles? And they don't necessarily have to be articles you've written. It can be like this morning, I shared a piece, my lawyer sent it to me about uh, like a, an addiction medicine perspective on the current leadership crisis in the United States. And it was fascinating. And I shared it on the Mindful Ohio website. So whenever people send me things, Mara sent me an article this morning, I'm going to read it. And if it feels like it's good content for the type of people who follow my work, post it. If you have a professional social media presence, I would challenge you to be posting some meaningful content at least three times a week. And it doesn't necessarily have to be content that you generate. Although what I mean by content that you generate would be blogs that you do, articles that you do, even a little short live cast or a short video that you put together. Hey, this is a meditation I'm trying out. I'd be happy if you would do it along with me. It can be a short teaching. Uh, we generally try to put something out on the professional sites every day, uh, just because we're, we're a larger company, a larger presence at this point. But if you're just getting started, 
uh, please consider on your professional pages and perhaps even your personal pages, if, if you use your personal for networking a lot, sharing some kind of meaningful content where you're not trying to sell people on anything. An article, a video, a blog, a podcast that you really liked. And then maybe every fifth day or every week, you can drop an event or drop a, hey, I'm an EMDR consultant and I offer groups at this day. So some of you EMDR folks in the group know that many of us are in groups on Facebook. So ICM has a group. Uh, there's a couple people like EMDR therapist resources that run a group. Some of us in yoga communities are in a group and they actually don't like you to post selling points or they don't want you to post them that often. But what you can do is engage in conversation. When new people ask questions like, well, what protocol do you use for this, that, or the other? And of course you need to set your boundaries because you can be on those groups all day <laughs> answering questions and having conversations. But maybe challenging yourself to say that three times a week, I'm going to answer someone's questions in the groups. And that is where people get to know you if you're an EMDR consultant as a consultant. Uh, in the yoga world and more of the wellness world, engaging in those conversations can be very important as well. So uh, content is king. Are you willing to, to put things out there? Uh, it could be on your personal website. Uh, although we're not specifically talking too much about your personal website today, uh, I, would, I would encourage it on, on social media. So content is king and context is queen is the second part of that. Content is king, context is queen. So what that means is, yeah, you can be posting a ton of content on Twitter, but if you have three followers on Twitter and nobody's really connecting with it, then, then, then you're kind of missing the context. So let's talk a little bit about social media. And I'll give you a little bit of my, my story, uh, my experience, strength and hope about how I let things unfold because I, I was not expecting at this point to be one of the most well-known EMDR personalities on YouTube, but I'll explain how, how that unfolded. So when we're talking about social media, because I know Roshan's asking here, what sites specifically, here's my feeling on social media. You have to, if you are choosing to use it as part of your network, figure out which ones feel organic to how I want to share content, which ones feel organic to me and that, yeah, like I enjoy spending time on Facebook, whereas I'm not a big TikToker, for instance, that may change. I don't know. But I got a TikTok account uh, over the summer thinking, oh, this might be another social media place I can make an impact. And it's like, no, I, I don't like being limited to a minute. That's why I like YouTube. But I will certainly look at other people's TikTok videos. And uh, I have other friends who network and share content. And TikTok is a perfectly organic platform for them because they do more of, of the short bites, right? So the ones I have the most direct experience uh, talking about would be Facebook. And one of the jokes is that, yeah, only old people use Facebook now, but hey, I, I guess I'm old by, by those standards, right? That a lot of my network, the context, the people who, who I am likely to reach with my message and, and with my product and, and, and my services are on Facebook too. So I, I of course have my political qualms about Facebook, uh, yet at this point, it's, it's just such a rich networking source where I have met so many amazing people. Uh, and yes, I saw the social dilemma and I agree with so much of what was being said in that documentary about the scourge of social media, but my experience has been, it has still paid off in terms of who I've been able to meet. People like Amy, uh, Holly Spienberg, who's another really good friend of mine and, and uh, member of the ICM Dancing Mindfulness community, she was moderating an EMDR therapy Facebook group at the time as a client. And I got into it with another member of the EMDR community and one of the comment threads. <laughs> and I ended up sending her a message saying, I'm really sorry, we should not have taken that into the Facebook forum. And then she and I started talking and here we are. Uh, so since we're speaking of Facebook's, uh, Facebook, I got a good question. How often do you boost your posts? 
I'll speak to boosting, I promise. So we'll, we'll start with Facebook and we'll spend a good amount of time on Facebook since I know a lot of you are on Facebook uh, just from seeing the names and seeing who's here. So one of the first deciding questions you have to ask if you're doing, and I'll talk, I'll explain boosting. I got that question too. One of the first things you will have to ask is, am I better served having a personal Facebook page, a professional Facebook page, or both? And I take a breath because people have their own feelings about boundaries, and I want to respect those. So I have another good EMDR friend who will rarely, if ever, post professional stuff on her personal Facebook because she really wants to keep a boundary that this is for my cat pictures and my food pictures and my vacation pictures and my professional page is for my professional stuff. If you're not a major level celebrity and Facebook defines that as 5,000 friends, I'm not saying that's the definition that if you have 5,000 Facebook friends, then you're a celebrity, but uh, I teeter around that. So at that point is when Facebook wants you to definitely have a professional page and do most of your work on, on your professional page. But here's, here's kind of the bear with professional pages. And Russ spoke to this with, with his question. Uh, if and people can like your professional page, but unless they're following it too, because that's a, a thing they have to indicate that they want to follow your page because of Facebook's algorithms, they may not see all the content that you're posting on your professional page. And yes, it was a, a business thing on Facebook's part many years back to make money through this thing called boosting. And so boosting, if you have a professional page, you'll often see the little icon that says boost this post, boost this post. And then what you end up doing when you boost is to say, I'll put 20, $30 and you can put in like who you boost it to. There's a lot of information there about target audience, age range. Uh, our web guy taught me how to, to do boosts better, right? And uh, yeah, it just makes sure more people see what you post on your professional pages. So it really is a way to, to get more visibility, to potentially get more ticket sales. And I, I will say, I do spend money on it. I don't spend a lot of money on it. It's, it's certainly not a big part of our budget. Like most of our budget for promotional stuff goes to our website at this point, because our website is so highly trafficked. Uh, but yeah, personal page uh, boosts can help. I've, I've had some trainees come through through boosting. Um, but it, I have never found it to be a guarantee yet. There are some, like if, if you are on your, your Facebook and the people you may follow like Mastin Kip or Brene Brown or people, Tony Robbins, who are really kind of high level, the reason they keep coming through your Facebook feed so much is because they have significant money and budget to boost, to boost posts, to boost sales. So uh, a marketing consultant may actually give you, or a person who, if you have a web designer you work with, can give you more direct coaching on whether boosting is worth it or not. And part of deciding if boosting is worth it or not is to try it out. Because uh, you can boost for putting like 20, 30 bucks into something, and it can still yield a, a, a couple returns. So we always kind of take this attitude, well, let's try boosting these kind of events once or twice. It's part of the let's try anything once and see if they do end up uh, yielding either people following your page, liking your page, or hopefully translating to sales. And if you do have a web designer or a web developer you work with, they can give you some more specific coaching about how you can actually track your sales that, that come from a boost. But in the spirit of networking, meaning you don't necessarily have to, to spend money on things, uh, I would challenge you to consider how you can use Facebook more to have organic conversations, to share your content. And then when people ask, um, hey, what do you do? All right, here's my website. Do you offer consultation? Yep. And Cindy, a very good point. You can schedule posts too. Yes, correct. 
So if you have a business site or several business sites and you don't necessarily want to be strapped down posting content three days a week or every day, you can schedule content posts. And uh, we've certainly made, made use of that. My biggest challenge for all of you is if you're a Facebooker is to share content three times a week or more. And not selling yourself, but actually sharing content. And that could be articles, videos, samples. It doesn't necessarily have to be your original stuff, remember. So part of the difference then between personal and professional, and those of you who follow my personal page probably saw the other day I posted an insight from my own therapy about inconsistency. I had so much engagement from that post. <laughs> I mean, and, and likes aren't necessarily the issue more than people actually commenting on it and having interaction and dialogue. And I will tell you, I'm still at the level where I choose to keep my personal page. A lot of my advisors wish I wouldn't and just keep things to the professional pages. Uh, but, but I get a lot of that organic conversational connection on the personal pages that that keeps things pretty authentic to, to what I do and what I what we do as ICM. Another thing you can do on your personal page is post a question. Like for you, what's the difference between networking and marketing? What's the difference between intention and goal? Sometimes you'll see put people put up those postings, hive mind, wondering what your thought is about, yeah, and if it's a controversial thing, be prepared for a potential shitstorm in the comments. And another boundary you may have to set is how many of those do I want to engage in? Because the bigger you may get, uh, the more haters you can get on comments. Uh, and I'll, I'll speak to that here in a moment, because for some people, that's their block to even getting big or reaching their intentions is I don't want to deal with the BS you deal with on YouTube comments. I don't read them at this point. But Mary and I will often joke, you know, you've arrived when people are calling you like a charlatan on YouTube or picking on your weight on YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but typically, if, if you have a, a, a small to medium network on, on social media, uh, having these organic conversations, I think, can be done more through the personal page. Or if you do share on your professional page, consider then bouncing it over to your personal page, particularly if you're trying to make these decisions about personal connection. Uh, we've, we've talked about it already. And uh, a couple people are commenting on it here in chat is Facebook groups can be a really another nice way to do networking. So I'll speak to the EMDR community because that's where I have the most knowledge. There are several EMDR groups and all of them have their own rules and you will need to respect those rules please respect those rules. Like some groups do not want you posting services or they might say you can only post about services on Wednesday. But the groups can be a great place to have conversation or you may consider starting one of your own groups. Uh, Pasha who, who was here, or I don't know if you're still here, uh, started a group that, that is a very dynamic place for one of the areas she's really interested in, in teaching about. Mara started a group. So uh, that's Facebook. And then I'm next gonna talk about Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and a couple of the other newer platforms and what you might consider doing. But something I will say is, <laughs> if you naturally spend a lot of time on Facebook, I know we've joked about that thing called doom scrolling just because, and, and that is some of the scourge of Facebook. I, I sometimes feel I spend too much time on it, but I also feel if I'm going to be spending an obscene amount of time on Facebook, let me use it as a networking device. Let me use it as a way to actually connect with people. So Mara, any, any thoughts you wanna add about Facebook? And then if, as Mara's speaking here, if anybody has any kind of random Facebook questions, I can't necessarily answer all the technical Facebook questions, but if you have something you might wanna ask about Facebook, go ahead and put that in chat. Yeah, um, I think, you know, I echo everything that Jamie has said about uh, sharing things that you find interesting, something that, uh, again, is aligned with your, your passions, your values. You can say a few things about it. You know, I have found 
uh, that forming uh, a few Facebook groups myself has been a really nice way to cross the personal and the professional um, because the generation of content is, is actually not only on me, but I'm trying to build community. And actually that's one of my missions in a sense um, in doing what, what it is that I'm doing in trying to actually bring together these two communities that really need to know each other um, to help EMDR therapists to understand perinatal mental health issues and to help perinatal mental health specialists to learn about EMDR and to understand trauma. So creating this community that the first one that I formed and then inviting people to join becomes a place for conversation. And it's interesting because then you have people, I have people saying, is it okay if I share my, that I have a consultation group? And I'm like, please share, mm -hmm. share all the things. There's, there's, a, there's a, a kind of uh, a cartoon I saw years ago mm -hmm. that really struck me. And, and is my, again, a core philosophy in terms of conversation. And that is, you know, some people have this idea of like, I like a thing, you like a thing. Uh oh, now we're in competition. I'm a geek. You like a thing and I like a thing. Let's like it together. Like with that kind of energy. And everything gets bigger. Everything mm -hmm. gets better. So I enjoy the groups. I, I will say it can be um, a lot of work to try to maintain that. So recruit help, recruit partners. You know, it's, again, we're not in competition. There is enough room for everybody. Yes. And so when you can approach it that way, um, you see that it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's really about saying, Hey, this is cool. Have you seen it? Yep. Thank you, Mara. So getting a couple of really good questions here about Facebook that I want to address. And one that I think applies to all social media. So one question is, uh, do you post on other people's posts often to create dialogue or just likes and thumbs up? I mean, likes and thumbs up are not going to do it as much as actual content discussion. So I'll, I'll say that, like, if you want to engage in, in a dialogue, I mean, if you feel it's getting volatile, I would say, don't go there. Don't engage. Um, yet if it feels like it's a good place for connection, most definitely. And when I first started getting to know other recovery groups on Facebook in, in 2012, when the first trauma, the 12 steps came out, that's how I built a lot of my connecting was I followed other pages. I started commenting on their posts and that's how I got involved with She Recovers, which is a huge online uh, community right now. And it started with me just getting to know them through their Facebook posts and commenting. So again, be willing to try anything once, most definitely. So another question is, uh, these two questions really correspond well together. How can I write my description that is still personal but speaks of my experience without sounding too much like marketing clickbait? And how do I decide the level of being personal, right, on, on social media? So in terms of your description, one of my best pieces of advice, is, advice there is write it up and test it out kind of with the little focus group in your own network of people to ask, how would this sound if you were reading it? Would it sound like I'm a real person who also happens to run services or does it sound like I'm trying to tell you something, sell you something and please give me honest feedback. That, that's my best recommendation there. And to, to the next question, yes, there is a balance between the personal and the professional, really that, that, that pervades marketing in whatever forum that you might be working in. And I also want to be clear that you have a right to your boundaries, most definitely. If, if, it, if it's like, I don't want to get too personal on social media because of XYZ, that's a very good thing. Many of you, though, know my work as an advocate in the mental health field. And one of my concerns is I think as mental health professionals, sometimes we can get so guarded that not sharing enough of the personal is what makes you sound like you're just trying to sell people something or you're coming across as an expert. So it is definitely a balance. I do share a lot of myself personally. I don't know yet if that's gonna end up killing my health in the long run, because one of my friends who really backed off from her social media presence said, Jamie, the access you give people to you, I, I couldn't do it. And I, I do have a lot of, of boundaries. I try not to answer personal messages that, uh, <sighs> Again, my gut is telling me and that, that it might be too much 
to, to get involved with. I don't answer clinical questions when people send them to me on Facebook. It's like, this is not the place for it. This is only something that somebody who's assessed you clinically. And I do try to provide people with referrals when I can. I do uh, now give a lot of forwarding to, this is a question for my office. So send it to my office. But I think some of what we're getting at is, do you, do you share about your life? Do you share about your journey? Do you share about the, the emotional struggles that you're going through? And my question is, yes, be authentic. However, also be mindful that social media is not your place for therapy. Because I know I am personally off put when people put up like five, six paragraph posts. It's like, write a blog. A lot of what you say may have to be important, but write a blog and maybe just give a couple words introducing the blog. I also can be kind of off put when I see professionals in the field sharing about stuff they clearly really haven't worked on yet. And I follow the advice of my first recovery sponsor, Janet Leff on this. She goes, only share publicly what you wouldn't be ashamed to have show up at a newspaper somewhere. And I will tell you this honestly about me, anything that I self-disclose I could care less if it ends up in the Youngstown Vindicator or the Warren Tribune, which means there's still a lot of things I am working on privately that I don't have out there, right? So you have decisions to make about that. And again, be open to feedback. Mm -hmm. Every level of disclosure I have made, whether it be about my sexuality, whether it be about my journey with spiritual abuse, whether it be about my journey with having a dissociative disorder, or having addiction has paid off. It, it's not just paid off in the level of, I feel better about myself now being public, but it usually does yield to people resonating with my message. But please know anything that I share about my personal journey on Facebook are things I've also talked to my therapist about. And by the time it gets onto social media, um, I feel confident engaging the contact. And that's even with a lot of my political advocacy work too, which has been, I know it's been a risky step I've taken in recent years, because that question also comes up. Do you talk about politics, religion? Uh, huh, what's your message? Mm -hmm. And for me, part of being especially an LGBT advocate is you better damn well be sure I'm going to be posting about politics. But I was not there four years ago. Four years ago, I was still kind of in this place of I don't want to alienate customers because I have people from the right and the left, both. But maybe it's just that I've grown into my business. I've grown into my voice where anything I post now even about political content, religious content, I'm also talking to my therapist about. So I hope that distinction makes sense. Mara, what, what about you? So, yeah, I mean, for me, um, I actually don't post a lot of, um, other than sharing articles on my personal page on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that I, I, I'm sort of actively working on thinking about how to engage in these ways. But I actually just am doing right now um, it was a meme or a practice or something. And, and the reason that I'm doing it, it's very personal, but it's also very connecting. Mm -hmm. And there's a theme. So like it's Hanukkah. And there was something that just sort of came to me about something very meaningful about this year and relationships and people and letting people know what they mean to you and what, how you see them. And it all sort of interweaves. And that's, that's another philosophy that I have a lot of. I'm such an integrationist at heart. So that when I see an opportunity to pull things together, then I get excited. Mm -hmm. And so then I'm more inclined to do something that's, that's a little more personal, that, that, or at least involve something more personal. Mm -hmm. And I think, that, Jamie, that's a lot of what you do. When I see you posting things that, that are personal on your personal page, but they, they also intersect with your mission, they intersect with something really clinically important or humanly important. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we can kind of, we're, we're really showing people the way I look at it is I'm a whole person. Mm -hmm. I am a whole person. I am a real person. And this is what you can expect when you engage with me. Mm -hmm. 
so it's going to be so when you think about that balance it's not a flood of personal information right. only it's not one-sided mm -hmm. it's reciprocal um it's thoughtful you know at least you try you know, at your moments um and so so it's another opportunity to 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 be transparent to show that authenticity and like you jamie um my authenticity has only um, watered the, the garden that I've planted. When I first started to teach around perinatal mental health issues and trauma, I was scared to let people know that I was a parent of premature babies. Speak more, was, because, this is a fascinating part of your story. Yeah, the, the perception that I had, and I don't think it's completely un, unfounded, is that if you let people know that you've walked that journey, they will they will diminish and discard, minimize what you have to say with this idea that, well, you have an ax to grind and that they that you can't be both. You can't say this is my lived experience and this is what I've learned from my lived experience. And this is what I hear from other people. And it's fascinating, even to the point that when 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 our book, our first book came out for parents of premature babies, um, it's filled, the book is shaped around the quotes of the interviews that we did with parents of preemies from all over the world. When you, and the book is 900 pages long. We hand the book to parents of premature babies and the response is, oh, thank God, finally. You hand that book to a physician and they're like, oh, this is gonna be overwhelming. And now I can say, overwhelming to who? Mm -hmm. You or the parent? Mm -hmm. because now it's been 24 years mm -hmm. and I know for sure that me being a whole person as a teacher and as a clinician adds value yeah. so I will use personal examples through everything that I do but it's always connected to something that I'm teaching mm -hmm. because I can infuse passion into what I say and how I describe it mm -hmm. and so like Jamie says I had to have worked on it because otherwise it goes off it would go off, you know, in a way that doesn't then bring it back to something teachable, some nugget that you can walk away with. Mm -hmm. For people who respond to networking more than marketing, I will say authenticity, authenticity, authenticity is, is golden. Uh, yeah. I, I, I have, I've looked at it this way that when I came out about having the dissociative disorder that I do, that was kind of the the real sticking one amongst mental health professionals like oh people are going to write you off as crazy and like you said or you have an axe to grind it has opened up more in the way of connections more in the way of work if we're talking about purely financials but more mm -hmm. more more than anything it, it's opened up a, a feeling better that i'm attracting the kind of people i want to be working with anyway yes. i remember this 2014 i got my nose pierced right I felt I had enough professional credibility at this point that I can get away with having a pierced nose and showing some of my tattoos publicly. Cause for so many years, my mom was like, oh, that that's going to put people off. And it dawned on me, if people aren't going to listen to me because I have a nose ring, these probably aren't the people that are going to most respond to my message anyway. And I, and I feel that way very much about what I have personally disclosed about myself, that if you're, if that's going to be a turnoff to you, that I'm getting my authentic message out there, we're probably not meant to work well together in the first place. And, and you will, you will attract, there's a 12 step saying attraction rather than promotion that I have always lived by mm -hmm. both in my recovery and as a, a networker in, in this realm that people will authentically be attracted to your authentic self. I believe that I, I've not experienced differently. Yeah, I think that's so true, Jamie. And I think that it, this is why I've said in the chat a few times, your voice, the voice that you bring to what you say and have, how you say it tells people a lot. And so when, for example, when I've done presentations, especially in person, when people will linger mm -hmm. and talk to you at a break, if it's a long one or afterwards, you know, so for example, the, nu the number of parents of preemies that come up to me, the number of NICU nurses mm -hmm. that come up to me and every one of them is gonna get a heartfelt hug from me 
because we are we are we are already connected. We just hadn't met yet. No. And so there's there's just it just again like make it bigger, make it bigger, make it broader. And if something about that scares you, it's an opportunity yeah. to reflect on maybe a piece that is still not quite digested internally for you yet, or woven in. And I'm going to transition back into the technical content here in a minute, but you bring up an overall question I'd like you all to write down if you're taking notes, just, just as another maybe assignment that you take from here today. And that is what's blocking you from putting yourself out there? Or perhaps what's blocking you from putting yourself out there in the way you want to? And in my experience, I think this is your feeling on it too, Mara, for most people that block is mental that some of these technical things like how to boost posts, how to do this, that, and other, you can look those mm-hmm. things up. You can, you can trial and error them, but so many of the blocks people have is things like we said earlier, well, people, you know, I'm not really offering anything new. People won't really listen to what I have to say. Sometimes the block could be because you've been so beaten down by other people you've worked with. Like those of us who've come out of community mental health, where it's like, don't, don't talk about yourself. Don't, don't, people don't want to know about what you've been through. So sometimes those are the blocks, or if you've worked in academics. Uh, so I, I'd ask you to consider that. And this is probably going to be the last question I'll offer in the workshop when we wrap up is what is blocking you from putting yourself out there? And could it be that doing around to some of your own healing work may be the best way you invest your money more than money that you put into boosting posts and marketing? Because another philosophy, personal philosophy I have, and you may not like to hear this, but it's been my lived experience. So I'll preface it with that. The growth you experience with your business or with your work you want to get out there is usually proportional to what your personal wellness and recovery can handle. Because I have friends who are asking things like, well, why aren't I further ahead? Why aren't I further ahead? And my kind of gut read on the situation is if you were, would you be able to still take care of yourself right now? Because I get the question all the time, Mara, Jamie, how do you do so much? Oh, yeah, same. Honestly, you might all be totally surprised how much time I put into self-care. And I don't want to perpetuate this myth that the purpose of self-care is to be more productive, because I I don't believe that's always the case, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, But I woke up this morning and did a yoga nidra and did my yoga routine like I do every morning. And I spend a lot of time and money on body work and my recovery principles and taking care of myself. If I didn't have that, I would fall flat on my face. I believe that with what I'm doing career-wise, or I would end up resenting the work that I do. So I'll, I'll insert that little personal nugget and ask what, what's blocking you from putting yourself out there? And we'll, we'll come back to this question here at the end of our time together. So something that Mara said, which I think is a good kind of bridge to talking about Instagram, if we're getting back into our uh, technical content here, Instagram as a platform or Pinterest perhaps, is memes. A lot of people love memes. And memes are, for those of you who don't technically know the word, or I think we all do at this point, those little blocks that could be a joke, it can be a profound quote. Uh, I felt I was starting to arrive in my field when people I didn't know were making memes featuring my teachings, right? But like this quote from this book, Dr. Jamie Marich, right? And it would go around. So uh, you can share other people's memes. This can be part of the content that you get out there. All I would say is to make sure you're giving proper credit if you know. Uh, and, and when if it's jokes, if it's the latest uh, angry cat and real housewife meme that's out there. I mean, there's so many of those circulating or those of us in Ohio, we have some amazing memes right now with our governor, Mike DeWine, who is, who's a pretty big Corona enforcer. Like it, it, it's just great. I love the DeWine memes. I've made a few myself. Right. But if we're talking about memes that have like significant social justice content on it, memes that have somebody's artwork on it, memes that have uh, a, a quote on it, make sure that the meme you're sharing at least has a, an attribution on it, like, you know, at Dr. Jamie Marich 
or the website. Like I share Southern Poverty Law Center memes a lot and it'll have like a little watermark at the bottom. Uh, or if you can directly share from let's say Southern Poverty Law Center's page onto your page, that way you're giving the organization or the artist you care about a shout out as well. Uh, I will say in my early days of uh, social media connecting in 2012, when the first Trauma and the 12 Steps came out, I, di I, I did a lot of connecting by sharing other people's memes on my pages. And often people will follow up and say, hey, thank you for sharing it. And that's another way I met some, some different recovery organizations as well. And you might consider making your own memes. Uh, programs like Canva, for instance, are relatively inexpensive and are pretty user-friendly where you can feature some of your own teachings uh, as, as memes and put, put a little watermark at the bottom with your website perhaps or your Instagram handle if you want people to find you. So the nice thing is I share a lot of memes uh, and more visual content on Instagram. Uh, Instagram is also an amazing place for artists. Uh, the hashtag could be a really cool way to find people on Instagram. So there's a hashtag expressive arts that's very active. There's a hashtag visual journaling that's very active. And of course we have our, our EMDR hashtag. There's also the hashtag musicians of Instagram, artists of Instagram, cats of Instagram. Mar and I started cats of ICM because uh, we post pictures of our cats quite a bit. Uh, find out what kind of the hot hashtags are if you are gonna do Instagram, because hashtagging is especially important on Instagram. And when you put up an Instagram post, put it up with a couple hashtags, because that's also how a lot of people have found me is, is through Instagram hashtagging. True story. <laughs> and Mary even said, yes, even our cats are working for us. I, I put up a picture of when my old cat was alive and our cat with the hashtag cats of Instagram and some cat website ended up finding it and saying, can we share this picture? And they put it out. Uh, we also have a picture in Cafe Press's offices and wherever they're located. Cafe Press does merchandise, right? Where you can put your logo on merchandise and have it ordered. And so when we first got Dancing Mindfulness t-shirts made, myself and one of our facilitators had our picture with our Dancing Mindfulness t-shirts and I hashtagged it Cafe Press and they, or I tagged them, it was one or the other. And because tagging can also be a nice way, as long as you're not disrespectful about tagging, but it's, because I think it can get annoying on Facebook, but on Instagram, it's kind of expected where you can put at Cafe Press. And then Cafe Press contacted me and they said, can we use this photo for our lobby? So use the hashtag and, and really do some exploring about what popular hashtags are in, in your area. So like Russ, um, if you're going to use Instagram, I would definitely say musicians of Instagram would be one you'd want to use, guitarists of Instagram. Uh, that's just an idea I can give. If you're an EMDR person posting EMDR content, EMDR, we have the hashtag redefine therapy that came about in 2015 uh, that have a lot of people have found us through that hashtag. And so Instagram is considered to be great for visual content. I'm not a big Pinterest person, I've never been, so I can't speak too intelligently to Pinterest, but if you know Pinterest, like Pinterest, spend a lot of time on it. That's also considered a really important platform for let's say fashion designers or people who work in food. And part of that context is queen thing is figuring out where are the people who you want to quote unquote connect with, or if you have services, sell your services to and, and consider using, using those, those hashtags. And then anything you share on Instagram, you can elect to share it to Facebook as well. Uh, several years back, Instagram put, put the thing, uh, sto Instagram stories, which was initially started with Snapchat, and I've never been a Snapchatter, but Instagram has stories now, Facebook has stories where you can put like a progression of, let's say, 10 photos. Let's say you're doing an event throughout the day, and you don't want to bombard with putting so many photo posts up, but you can have people kind of chronologically follow your story. I've had a lot of amazing engagement with Instagram stories because I'm, I'm a tortured wannabe filmmaker, right? And, and Instagram and Facebook stories are a great way to, to do chronology and do storytelling for me. And uh, we've had so many people come up to Mary at events saying, I know you from Jamie's Instagram stories. 
So that might end up being a really organic platform uh, for you. So yeah, we're getting a couple shout outs to Instagram here. Uh, so Ross, this is a good question. Do you want to drive people to your website or are the social platforms enough? Yes, you want to drive people to your website, especially if that's where the stuff you're selling is. <laughs> if you have product, if you have CDs, if you have trainings. So yes, you want to make sure that, let's say if you're making a meme, for instance, at the bottom in small print, you might want to put your actual website. Now, Facebook allows you to put your website in your profile. Instagram doesn't uh, hyperlink quite as well, but you can put your Facebook in your Instagram bio. And often when I throw up a post on Instagram, I'll say link in bio. And so yes, any social media you do ought to have some kind of link to your, to your website. So, uh, and I often say, <laughs> To me, Instagram's a nicer place than Facebook. Uh, uh, four years ago, there was another election, some of you may have been aware of, and I, I had to not be on Facebook for a time. It was just very, especially because I wasn't speaking up so much up at that point, and there was just a lot of, uh, so I just stayed on, on Instagram and bounced posts over to Facebook, so I still had content on Facebook. Uh, but you might find that Instagram is, is, is much more your style, right? Uh, Twitter. <sighs> I have a, <laughs> I'll tell you my Twitter story. Twitter is what marketers will tell you is the one you want to be on. I mean, clearly a lot of our, our politicians are making ruckus on Twitter, right? And that Twitter is the place you want to be having conversations, I have never found as personally as much organic connection on Twitter as I have on Facebook or as I have on Instagram, even using hashtags because hashtags are a thing on Twitter too. But I've, I've kind of chipped away at it. I'll still post tweets. I'll put some of my content on Twitter if it feels organic. I've been given the tip that the way to get other Twitter followers and retweets is, is, is to engage in conversations with people on Twitter too. Uh, another fun fact, I've gotten more Twitter followers and, we, and re retweets from speaking out against one of our senators here in Ohio. I follow him and I comment on him <laughs> about not liking a lot of his policies and so many people have retweeted that. So I will say Twitter is where I tend to do even more of my political speaking out. Uh, and I follow a couple of theologians I really like on Twitter. Nadia Boltz Weber has a huge Twitter presence, John Pavlovitz. And I've met some other friends on Twitter just from inter interacting there. I'm also a big figure skating fan and there's a huge figure skating fan presence on Twitter. And I've met a lot of friends through that way. So here's my Twitter story though, because there have been times over the years where I have said, is this even worth it? I got published in the New York Times in 2017 because of Twitter. And this is in the article that, that we sent around. Uh, there's a, a New York Times uh, journalist named David Gellies who found me using the hashtag dancing mindfulness because he was doing a series called meditation for real life, where he wanted to focus this idea that every human activity like I teach is, is a method for mindfulness. And he interviewed me for the New York Times article on dancing mindfulness that came out in 2017. And then they ended up recycling it in 2020 for one of their podcasts. So I've told Mary, because Mary wants me to tweet more, based on the fact that Twitter got me in the New York Times, <laughs> I'll, I'll still give Twitter a chance. But the key is, are you using hashtags? Because uh, that's often how people will find you. Are you tagging other people if, if they're in conversations? Um, and there's also a book called The Tao of Twitter, uh, which I found frustrating. But if you really want to try to up your Twitter game, you can certainly uh, try to do that as well. Oh, Roshan, thanks for sharing that article with your sixth graders. Yeah, the New York Times article uh, on dancing mindfulness. I'll, I'll go ahead and, and put it up in the chat uh, in case you're interested, because I do think it's a great overview of dancing mindfulness, right? Yep, it's how to be mindful when you're dancing from 2017. So the last social media platform that I want to speak about, because I do consider it a social media platform, even though uh, 
I didn't originally think of it as a social media platform as YouTube. So when I first heard of YouTube, it was about 2006, 2007, and it was something that like every artist on the planet seemed, oh, we'll talk about LinkedIn, Mara, <laughs> sometimes called the Dane Cook of social media. Uh, yet with, with YouTube, I used a lot of YouTube initially. If I wanted to check out new artists, Stacy's saying here, I found Jamie on YouTube when I was looking for an EMDR demo to show a client. Yeah. And a little tip that I got early on is that a lot of older folks will use YouTube when they're not so keen on using things like Facebook. Like I don't like my mother is so reluctant to have a Facebook account. She has one, but it took her years to have one. And she's like, I don't want to have accounts. So you can use YouTube to look up videos, to look up content without necessarily having to have a Facebook account, an Instagram account, you know, et cetera, et cetera, for users. And, uh, and I think this is why I've had probably my most success on YouTube. So here's where I started to click together why I should have more of a YouTube presence. Circa 2013, 2014, I was teaching on trauma, teaching on mindfulness. And I was giving a course once and I was explaining Ujjayi breath, which is a yogic breath technique. And I said, oh, look it up on YouTube. There's tons of people who teach Ujjayi breath on YouTube. And then eventually it's dawned on me, well, then why don't I have a video up there teaching Ujjayi breath on YouTube? If I'm sending people to YouTube for all of this content, why don't I start creating some content? And so I had the good fortune in 2014, one of my old speech and debate students had to do a social media internship for her communications degree. So she asked me, she, she calls me mama, that's her nickname for me. She says, mama, can I work for you next summer? I said, sure. And so her name was Kara Maisie and, and she, she put together my first in earnest YouTube effort in 2014. And it was largely about uh, coping skill videos, things like breath work, things like uh, progressive muscle relaxation stuff we would want clients to see. And then the 2017 demos happened or the 2016, 2017 demos. So after we started doing EMDR training, it was the same thing. Amber and I were looking for demos on YouTube to give our students because we would teach them a concept like how to do calm safe place, how to do this, how to do that. And I remember once we had, this was a turning point moment for me. I hope you find these stories helpful because I, I do like, it's like, yeah, this is how it happened. We had a trainee who was pregnant and she had a miss out on day one of the EMDR training in the afternoon because she had what she thought was a medical emergency. And so she went to the ER and fortunately everything was fine. And she called us that afternoon and said, well, can I come back for day two and three of the training? And we were like, well, you missed the demo. So Amber and I scoured YouTube to find something that was kind of okay to show her. And we found something that was kind of okay, but it was still pretty eh, weird. And at that point, I'm like, man, we got to make our own demos and put them on YouTube. Because yeah, a lot of EMDR therapists at that point had made demos, but a lot of people sell them. Uh, and if you want to, to sell your videos, that, that's certainly an option you can make, but it just felt like a service we needed to provide. That if we're making money on EMDR trainings, we want to give demo content to our students so that they can look, look up later. And so in 2016, I filmed some demos, put them up on YouTube, largely for our students. That next year at Emdria, I, I went to Emdria in 2017. And at that point, I had enough of a reputation in the EMDR community. Some people knew my books and my articles. I was swarmed at Emdria with people saying, you're Dr. Marich from YouTube. Not you're Dr. Marich who wrote EMDR made simple. You're Dr. Marich from YouTube. And I'll be at EMDR events now where people say, well, where do I know you from? And I'm like, YouTube. <laughs> and that's that's usually where, where it happens. So um, YouTube has worked for me, but the reason it has worked for me is because I put a lot of content on it. And I will say the content that people respond the most to on YouTube's are demonstrations. Because I put all interviews up on YouTube 
when I do interviews with people and we'll get a couple hundred hits on each interview, which is nice. But I mean, I have almost 500,000 views of my, my popular demo of EMDR that's on YouTube. And then, you know, thousands of views for many of the others. And at the end of every video, we put a link for where to find the Institute for Creative Mindfulness. Uh, Russ asks me, do you have separate YouTube accounts like on Facebook? You can. Some people have a personal YouTube and a professional YouTube. But I will say that if, if you kind of keep them all in one place together, that's how you build subscribers. Because the way you get a real significant YouTube following and can actually make money on YouTube is if you get more than a thousand subscribers. So you may want to ask people, well, will you, will you subscribe to my page? It's like following a Twitter account or following a Facebook account. So uh, yeah, before I knew it, I, I went from like 35 subscribers to like 3000 just from EMDR demos. And now we're, we're close to 9,000 subscribers. We're meaning me and, and Russ, I just kept it my personal Jamie marriage account that I started with when I was still largely doing music. And now I, I put it as Jamie marriage, the Institute for creative mindfulness. Right. So I would encourage most of you, cause I know a lot of the work that, that you do here to consider YouTube. Yes. Interviews can be nice you kind of giving a teaching on YouTube can be nice, but what people, you sharing a song can be nice. And, and I have a lot of my music on YouTube as well. And, and people will find it and respond to it if, if you uh, put it up there usually. But what people, especially in helping professions seem to really want is content usable demonstrations, skills. Yoga Nidras are hugely popular on YouTube. Uh, I send people to yoga for, to YouTube for Yoga Nidra because even like Amrit Yoga Institute where I studied, you have so many free Yoga Nidras up there and they still sell them too. And, and you can have, have a balance where you may give some of your stuff away for free and, and sell some of your stuff. But I will tell you every major Yoga Nidra teacher on the planet has at least two or three free yoga nidras on YouTube. And I think that's just a great service to provide, especially if you, if you are gonna make money with, with trainings. So uh, that's something I, I would ask you to consider. Now, how do you market your YouTube page? I got that question come through. Honestly, uh, Rafi's, I didn't even try. It was simply a, a, a thing of, oh, I put up content so I could send my students to it all in one place and maybe other folks will find it easier because YouTube's a great way to just share videos because you can put up long videos that you can't necessarily email, right? Uh, but yeah, in our experience, peop people like demonstrations on YouTube. Uh, little, little, little teaching contents. And YouTube, then you could easily embed YouTube videos into your professional website. And another way people can find you on YouTube is YouTube does have that algorithm for recommending other similar videos. So you may watch Rod Stryker's Yoga Nidra and then one of Kamini's comes up as a recommendation. So a lot of people have said they have found in my, my Yoga Nidras or my EMDR demos because it's just come up as a recommendation. So please consider leveraging YouTube. I, I really, really think that's, that's a, an important one. Uh, and I, I feel this way about YouTube. I think a lot of us who are politically conscious are aware that there's a lot of junk on YouTube. So set an intention to create some good stuff, some good content that is quality so that we, we do get a little bit of a balance to this part, this kind of, <laughs> uh, arena that is YouTube. That can be pretty uh, wonky. Uh, Mara, do you use LinkedIn significantly or not? Yeah. And so LinkedIn is the other major one we haven't talked about. When I first signed up for LinkedIn, it's L-I-N-K-E-D-I-N. -I -E when I first signed up for it, oh, and Russ just plugged his YouTube channel in the chat. Yeah. If you have a YouTube channel, share it with us. We'd be happy to subscribe to your, to your YouTube channel. Uh, when you join, I, LinkedIn was described to me as it's the professional Facebook. 
when I was in my doctoral program, they're like, oh, keep your personal stuff on Facebook and do your professional stuff on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is really allows you to kind of put up a glorified resume and potentially interact with other professionals. Again, I've made some contacts on LinkedIn. Uh, one of the jokes among social media savvy people is I got bored this afternoon, so I went on LinkedIn, like just, just to kind of see what's happening, seeing maybe who's sending me a message on LinkedIn. And it, it is a good place for doing some professional level networking. There's now a capacity where you can share a lot of your articles on LinkedIn. And I, I, I've had people connect via LinkedIn. So I kind of feel about LinkedIn the way I do about Twitter. I don't have so much connection there where it feels like I want to invest a whole lot of time in it, but I've made enough connections where I keep my LinkedIn profile up to date. I share articles, I share content on LinkedIn. So uh, go ahead, Mara. Um, what I've seen over time is that there are, there are ways to work LinkedIn very effectively. And it also depends a little bit on what you're trying, what you're trying to build there. Mm. So LinkedIn offers trainings, for example, mm. that I didn't even know existed. Um, LinkedIn offers ways to introduce people to other people. Um, there's a lot there that has a lot of similarities to what we've been talking about, about Facebook and other platforms in terms of like when all you see is, you know, you get, a, you, you accept a connection and then immediately you get a, a private message from somebody selling their thing on yeah. this like. Earth, that's annoying. right so so that's not how to use LinkedIn um, but but LinkedIn can be a way to to also find people that you might not actually find on other social media platforms mm -hmm. you know, really other professional connections and people who maintain that sort of page because it's sort of part of what you know maybe if they're in a, uni in a university or they're the head of an agency or something like that that they're doing good work so it, it's it's an avenue that I think is worth exploring See also if it resonates for you. Like if you can figure it out, um, talk to somebody maybe who uses it well and really enjoys it. Because there's people who really like LinkedIn. So I think that it's also a little bit about like, what flavor do you prefer <laughs> of how to, how to get out there? And sharing articles can be great. I will say there is somebody that I, I know on, on LinkedIn who is almost constantly sharing articles and it, it's almost, it's too much. Mm -hmm. You know, I even have the thought of like, where do you have all this time <laughs> to mm -hmm. be doing this? Um, so it's a funny, it's a funny kind of uh, platform, but it does, it does have place. People who are not professionally on other platforms will be on LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah. And, and as I've shared, I have virtually no experience, strength and hope to offer about things like uh, Snapchat, Pinterest, TikTok, other than to say, if it feels like an organic place for you to engage in this arena, in this forum of, of public discourse, uh, go ahead and do it. Cause you, you might be surprised. There's a lot of therapists now, definitely a lot of musicians, certainly a lot of comedians on TikTok, uh, which is might, might be worth, worth exploring. Okay, so remember content is king, context is queen. Uh, so in terms of how do you let people know about what you're doing? Well, obviously, if you make a YouTube video, for instance, share it on your LinkedIn, share it on your Facebook, share it on your Twitter. A lot of you see me do that. As soon as I publish something, as soon as I make a video, uh, I announce it on my other social media. And that's just a way that you can also create a lot of cross connections, uh, et cetera. Okay, so I, I promised we'll spend some time at the end uh, about the blocks. The other issue though I want to address in terms of substantial content, and if you do think of other questions that are coming out, I'll make sure we have a good half hour here before our scheduled end time to, to specifically answer questions because I do hope you're finding this useful, is things like public speaking and writing a book. Because I get that question a lot as somebody who's written many books and as somebody who speaks and trains for a living. Uh, let's talk about getting your written content out there. Because some of you who are, let's say, musicians, yeah, sharing your songs can be a great thing. But I'm already thinking outside the box, like Russ, for you, I, I think potentially even sharing a video, like 
how to do sacred chant, how to do basic chord patterns, how to, people are looking up how to's all the time on YouTube. And then that may be a way if you're willing to give them like some of, 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 a, of a structured lesson, then they may get to the things about your songs. Like Kelly, like you, you're a poet and you wrote about poetry. Uh, I could see you doing a YouTube video, like how to get over your blocks about poetry writing. So maybe think whatever you're doing, whatever it is you want to get out there in the world, how can you turn it into more of an instructional or service video on YouTube or an instructional or service article? Like the original networking article that I wrote two years ago. I, I wrote that largely because people asked for it. And that might be something I end up monetizing at some point as a workshop or doing consulting on networking. But for now, it's just a service that I, that I have out there. And it's led a lot of people to me. So uh, let's talk about writing. Because I, I do think on one hand, most people I've met want to write a book. I know I was certainly in that camp, like, oh, I want to write a book, but I don't think I'll ever be able to, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of ways to share your written content without writing a book. And I would ask you to consider that in this day and age, writing blogs and articles may be the better way to share your written content. Because there's a lot less money in book writing than, than you think. I mean, the statistic is something like 1% of authors earn 99% of the wealth in publishing, like your Stephen King's, uh, et cetera. And I would say the only reason book writing actually is a revenue channel for me is because I'm so networked with everything else. And students who come to my courses buy my books. Students who uh, let's say take a workshop like this can, can buy a book. People who watch the YouTube videos can, can buy a book. And I, I will say the advice I can give on writing is that I am largely a clinical writer. I'm not a fiction writer. I'm not a, and, I, and I'm a pretty good technical writer too, or, or kind of textbook clinical articles. Uh, I, I don't really do self-help. I mean, a couple of my books like Dancing Mindfulness and Process Not Perfection are a little more consumable by the general public, but I mostly write for other clinicians. And one of the pieces of, of, of reflection I can give is when other clinicians will come to me with a book idea. Sometimes it's a proposal, sometimes it's a chapter. One of the first gut level reactions I have for them is it's so clear to me you haven't taught on this enough or you haven't talked about it enough, that you're writing it more like a college paper, or you're writing it more as like, you're trying to show me everything you know. My process for writing books is by time I go to sit down and write a book, it comes out of me like it's nothing, only because I've taught about it so much, I've talked about it so much, and I've written blogs and articles about it so much. So somebody said that they don't get blogs. Can you talk a little bit more about blogs? I mean, blog uh, is short for web log, for those of you who aren't familiar with that terminology. And it's essentially a less formal version of an article. Because I think any of us would have familiarity with what a good magazine article would be or what, what a good content article would be. And yes, there are a lot of venues out there that will pay you for articles. A lot of times you have to get good at writing a pitch. Like if you want somebody big like the Atlantic to publish you, you have to, to write a pitch to them or they have to come to you. Like the New York Times came to me on that one. But a lot of how you can get your writing out there initially is, is blog writing. And some of you may choose to start your own blog or consider looking around at what other places publish other people's work. So for instance, The Mighty, uh, some of you know that mental health site, they, they take open submissions all the time. And I've written several pieces for the mighty, uh, as would places like Huffington Post, but it's really hard to get in unless, unless they approach you. And then some people decide to go the route of starting their own blog. Like we as the Institute for Creative Mindfulness have the, uh, the Redefined Therapy blog. And a lot of our pieces 
that are, are very well known, I've chosen to just publish on our blog and I'm going to go ahead and put that in. And Katerina is sharing some of her blogs. Yeah, if you have a blog, go ahead, put that up in there for us too. Because that is a way that people can also get to know about your services. So if you've written uh, like how a lot of people came to know about me and my work with dissociative identity disorder and, and dissociative disorders is the coming out blog that I wrote in, in 2018. And I published it first on the Institute for Creative Mindfulness, then the mighty picked it up because sometimes other blogs will pick up what you've written on, on your own blog uh, or you can submit and they'll, they'll republish it. So I, I think my sense is, because I'm getting a question here about, I, I don't want to do my own blog, but I'll, but I'll maybe submit for other blogs, is look around and see what are the kind of blogs or article sources you may like to read. Like if you read articles a lot from, let's say, The Medium or The Mighty, which I talked about, uh, maybe you look to see what is their protocol for submitting. So uh, if you're a mental health clinician or professional, I want to pitch The Mighty because they, they will take a lot of content from people who are not necessarily well known. And if you share a blog out there of your work that, hey, look, the mighty pick this up, because uh, they do, there is a, a review. I mean, they don't just take anything that, that comes through. Uh, but the mighty, let's say, is a heck of a lot easier to get into than something like Huffington Post. Uh, if you are in the yoga world, uh, Elephant Journal, uh, I haven't written for them for a while because I think they got a little substandard with with what they take and and they now have a platform where you can kind of have your own blog through elephant journal i think medium is set up that way too where you can make a medium account uh psych central i believe is that way uh, psychology today they they have more of a vetting process where you have to apply to write for their blog uh, but these are all potential options that that i can give you and and once more i'll just summarize it at as when people pass articles around social media, look at where they're coming from. And if you say things like, wow, the mighty publishes a lot of stuff I like, or Elephant Journal publishes another stuff I like, a lot of stuff I like, go to their website and look at what their submission protocol is. So that's a way you, you can get a lot, of, a lot of things out there. But I will say there's been a lot of organic spread through some things we've put up on the Institute for Creative Mindfulness blog. Uh, the blog I did last year called Before You Talk Shit About Another Addict, uh, we had that one went like wildfire. And the mighty ended up picking it up, but it was very well received on our original blog. The dissociation blog that I wrote in 2018, uh, that's where I started to get a flood of emails from people who read it when it went around. And another thing I, I can also recommend, and this to me is just good karma, your willingness to have people, your willingness to share other people's stuff helps them out. And I think it returns to you that if they are willing then to share your stuff, then your stuff gets shared. Because I often will say like in my networking groups, I would appreciate if you could share this video, if you could share this article. And of course, if we shared everything people posted, then our own social media would be clogged. So you have to use some discretion. But how things really end up spreading is when others are willing to share your work too or, or retweet. So uh, yeah, if, if you are thinking about doing a book, my question is, have you first done some blogging? Uh, Jill gave a pitch to Good Therapy also accepts articles. Yeah, and some of these websites now you have to at least have an account to submit articles. And it's not necessarily even a paid account because like with The Mighty, I have an account with The Mighty. It's a dashboard. I submit articles through there. They recently did my pitch or my article that was a commentary on the series Ratchet. So um, yeah, I, I really like The Mighty if, if you are in like wanting to get started, not necessarily worried about getting paid for your work, but it's more about spreading it out. And then if it's an issue of you getting paid to do articles, usually people will approach you if it's a paid writing job, but they may not find you until they see some sample of your work that you've been willing to, to put out there. 
And I will say it's it's not for nothing because so much of the, the work I give away with, with blogging and article writing is calisthenics for when I go to write a book because I've written about it so much in the short form, in, in the blog form. So the thing with book writing, because I think a lot of people feel that having a book out there is going to help build their brand. That's more the purview of marketers because there's some marketers that really sell their services on here, let's write a book together and self-publish it and it'll help to build your brand. Um, so I can't really speak to that. I will share a piece of advice I got when I started writing and what I have gotten now from having worked with five or six different publishers in, in my career. A book is not gonna sell just sitting on Amazon. Because now the self-publishing market is so big and I've independently published a few of my books even though I've worked with publishers for several others. This is Misty, everybody. This is one of the hashtag cats of ICM uh, behind me. And even one of the questions that a publisher will ask now when you make a proposal to them is what is your social media presence like? I hate to burst your bubble if you're wanting a publisher to pick up your great book idea. Gone are the days of a really good idea getting picked up. I don't like the way that that is. But if another publisher, an outside party is going to put money into your book and developing your book, they want to know that you already have the network in place to promote it. And you know, Katrina, I ask you a really good question. What about writing a book out of the need to express oneself, give one's perspective? Well, yes. And if that's truly your intention and goal in writing the book and you don't care how many people read it, or how much money you make on it, then yeah, independently publish. That is probably the way to go. And it's so easy to do now with a platform like what used to be Create Space, it's now Kindle Direct Publishing. Uh, and that's, that's the one we've worked with on our independent ones because it has the direct line to Amazon. And so somebody asked, how many books have I done? I think the count's up to 10. Uh, five have been with publishers five we've done on our own, and I have two more in, in under contract with publishers. So a lot of the decisions I've made there is, is there a value to going with a publisher? Because I think a lot of mm, the belief out there, unless somebody like me has <laughs> told you the inside story, is that a publisher is going to pick up a proposal because it's a really great idea even smaller, more independent publishers like the ones I've worked with want to see that you have something in place to promote your book. And then if it's a great idea, they see great quality, plus you have the built-in publishing or the built-in networking plan or marketing plan, then they'll usually, then they, then you might get an offer. But even if you get an offer from a publisher, yes, they can help you with editing. They'll help you with design packaging. Uh, it's still really on you to promote. You get a little help from publishers on promoting, but it's still really on you to promote or then hiring a publicist to help you promote. And really you only get a very small percentage of the sales. It's at best about 15, 20% at best if a publisher is picking up. Now, why have I chosen to go with a publisher for some of my books? A lot of it's credibility. Like in the EMDR community, if you have a book out with Springer Publishing, you're considered like you know your stuff. And so Steve and I, when Springer picked up our EMDR and mindfulness book, we made that decision because like, could we have put it out on our own and made more money? Probably. But having it on the Springer label automatically kind of boosted its credibility in the EMDR community. But let me give a real uh, shout out to self-publishing because I think, and I could still sometimes deal with this ish, like what's blocking you from putting yourself out there? Oh, books that are self-published aren't seen as as credible because I think, I, I think that's changing a little bit, 
But the shadow side of that is, well, now anybody can write a book, that there's no real kind of peer review in the process. But here's the reason I decided to self-publish the first edition of Trauma and the 12 Steps. This was in 2012. I had two publishing offers for it, but they both wanted me to make concessions that I was not willing to make. For instance, one of the publishers said, we'll let you write a trauma and addiction book, but we don't want you to have 12 steps in the title. And then there were some problems with the other deal that I got. And so I decided this idea I want out in its original form that I came up with. I'm not willing to make concessions on this. And so I decided to self-publish. And that's how I met Steve. That's how I met so many people, Dan Griffin, who are now in my network by, by making that decision to put that book out there. And so a lot of it is, and, and Katrina, I think I, I had this feeling that I didn't really care about sales. I mean, it would have been nice if I at least broke even on the money that I put into it. And I've more than done that, which, which is good. But a lot of that is because I'm out there. But a lot of what book writing is about, I feel, is it's truly your mission. It might be that this thing is just bursting out of my heart and it's something I have to do for myself. And part of intention versus goal is like with trauma and the 12 steps and God's honest truth. My goal was to break even, get the word out there and help it reach some people. And it's now probably the book I'm most known for. And a publisher did pick it up for the second edition. It's selling better than anything else I've ever done. And I met so many people who are in my network right now. And so this might be something that marketers don't want you to hear. What are you doing this for? I think if, and, and so many of you on this call I know, and you're, you're soulful people who yes, want to make a living. And I honor that intention. Yet you would probably do a lot of your work for free too. And if you can bring some of that, just, just, just real desire and passion for the mission into this, uh, you might be surprised what happens in terms of outcome. And to me, this is, goes back to what we shared at the beginning, the beauty of intention instead of goal. Intention instead of goal. So, that's my feeling with books versus blogs versus articles. And the other thing with books too, it's, it's the similar thing to what I said earlier about do what people are asking you for. You may have this, what you think is an amazing idea for a book, especially if you are writing for more of a clinical audience. But here is where I do like talking to the publishers they have their finger on the pulse of what will sell, but that also kind of translates to what people want, what people really need. And it was through kind of jawboning with my first publisher that I came up with the title EMDR Made Simple and then Trauma Made Simple. It's like, yeah, that's something people want uh, and something people will probably be attracted to. And sometimes that's not so important to you. Like with Trauma and the 12 Steps, the publishers told me people won't buy that. And I, I really felt they were wrong on that one. <laughs> and I held my guns and held to my vision and, and it kind of came through. So the other network of, of networking I want to give you as an idea that we haven't covered yet is the whole, we talked about videos. Obviously, a lot of you here are trainers and teachers and you want to get your, your services out there. And I gave you a little bit of my kind of experience, strength and hope about that with how I, just doing some natural networking might help you uh, be able to, to, to book work that, that is paid. Uh, another public speaking outlet that many people are finding success with is the podcast. Here's my feeling on podcasts because what I'm sharing with you is from my belief of, ah, you know, I'll try anything once. I, I tried a podcast once and I may be willing to try one again. I may be willing to try one again. 
uh, but rebranded a little differently for a slightly different audience. Uh, I did not find there was too much engagement on the first podcast I tried. Like you had a couple hundred people listen to it here and there, but I wasn't really getting the emails and the inquiries like, oh, I heard you on your podcast. Where I have gotten a lot of engagement is being a guest on other people's podcasts. <laughs> So, for instance, in the clinical world, there's a well-known uh, podcast called the Trauma Therapist Podcast. And I, I think having a podcast is largely like writing a book. You, you really have to have this dedication to want to do it, to have to get your message out there. Because just like anybody could self-publish a book, anybody can produce a podcast. Uh, Anchor, Libsyn are both platforms where you can make your own podcast. They're very easy to do and they're very easy to get out there. But again, people aren't going to find your podcast just by it sitting even on Apple Podcasts. I mean, they might, like they might find your video on YouTube doing some searching and you can tag and describe your podcast, but it's, it's very much like word of mouth. You have to let people know that that your podcasts are out there. So I've appeared a couple times on the Trauma Therapist podcast. It's, it's, an, it's an excellent podcast for trauma therapists. Mara's been on it too. And we've gotten a lot of people who hear us on podcasts that end up sending us messages. Uh, I've guested for my, my buddy, Dr. Rob Weiss, who's put a lot of work into his podcast. And so I personally feel the best expenditure of my time. And Mary knows this. Whenever we get a podcast interview request, I usually take it. Uh, because it gives me an opportunity to talk to people about what I'm doing. They already have a, a kind of built-in fan base to listen to it. So you may consider, and this is part of the ethic I told you about earlier, don't be afraid to put yourself out there. You know, the worst you can get is a no or a no answer, is to see what, what, which podcasts do you like? Like one of these days, I will be on one of Brene Brown's podcasts. <laughs> That's a vision, a wish I've set for myself. I, I mean, I'm not at that level or haven't gotten her, her interest yet to, I, I think somebody recommended me to her once, but uh, yeah, like she has a very established podcast. So I think we did send her just a blind pitch about potentially endorsing trauma in the 12 steps. And we got a very nice rejection letter. I mean, the nicest possible I'm sorry, I don't have the time. Wish you well with the project that, that one would expect from, from Brene Brown. Uh, but, but see what other podcasts you listen to. And you can aim big. I mean, people have done it, aiming big, sending the message. And it could be the exact story you have to tell is exactly what Brene Brown is looking for at a certain time. Oh, you guys are also great saying, I could see you being on her show. Do me a favor, recommend me. <laughs> send me an email to her or, or, or tweet my stuff to her. Cause that's often how podcasters find guests is, you know, who should I know about? Who should I be talking to? Uh, Nadia Boltz Weber, who is uh, a progressive minister whose work I follow regularly on her Twitter, she will put, I'm looking for a podcast guest, somebody who X, Y, Z was a part of this movement or a part of this story. So following the people you like on Twitter might be, wait, wait, I have that exact story to tell. And then you follow up with them. So see whose podcasts you like, who you listen to, and send them a message just to say, hey, if you're ever looking for guests in this area, uh, I'd, I'd be happy to. And so we've gotten uh, a couple podcast interviews that way with us reaching out to podcasts. So uh, yeah, whether you're reaching out to other podcasts or whether you're creating your own, that's, that's a, a vision that I would also put out for you to consider. But creating your own podcast is similar to writing your own book. Uh, although just doing it can help, and it might certainly help in the way of, hey, I just have the story to tell. I have to tell it. I have to get it out there. Uh, it's more about if you really want to put the time into building it and building your following, like Guy McPherson has done that with the trauma therapist podcast, and it's helped to sell a lot of his consulting services. It may feel like podcasting is very organic for you. Uh, so Mara, any other thoughts here on what I might be missing about uh, podcasting or being a guest on other people's interview spots? I to think if there's anything you have haven't already covered that I would offer. 
Um, definitely, you know, go into these interviews with, you know, energy and curiosity to get not selling your thing, you know, sharing what you know, sharing how you do what you do, sharing your story. It's actually kind of a, a, a nice place to potentially integrate a lot of what we've talked about already today. You know, how much transparency do you want to bring to an interview like that? How much, you know, what do you share that's going to be engaging? Um, I, I, it's funny, I came back from the last workshop that I did uh, before COVID um, on fire about starting a podcast. Um, and then COVID hit and, you know, we all had to sort of reorganize and all the energy went into that. Um, but the idea of if you are somebody who likes to talk to other people, if you are somebody who really enjoys doing interviews, Jamie, you are one of those people for sure. I love um, the interviews. You're, yeah, it's, it's, it's really, it's fun to watch. Um, then, you know, if you have relationships with people who you admire and you really enjoy talking to in, in whatever the topic area is or range, or range of topic areas, doing your own podcast may well be really enlivening for you. So I, I really think that any of these activities, the question is, is this an energy drain or does this light me up? Which is not to say that these things aren't a lot of work either way, but when you imagine doing it, when you imagine the meat of it, having those conversations, saying to somebody that you have had a professional connection with or you would like, you, you know, maybe you already have a relationship with even, um, what do you think? Would you be interested in doing this? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's another way to, again, sort of spread the love <laughs> because when you're inviting somebody in to, to talk on your podcast, you're saying to them, I see you, I value you, I want people to know about what you're doing, right? So it's, it's a really nice example actually of that mutuality mm -hmm. um, in networking, I think. I think it can be a real you know, uphill curve to figure out how to do it, to make time and space for it, to think about how to do it, um, but there, there are actually um, good uh, Facebook groups for this mm -hmm. and, and, pod and a podcast about how to do a podcast. Yeah. Um, because I actually got as far as talking to one of the very first people who'd invited me onto her podcast, Mom in Mind, just to pitch mm -hmm. it as a wonderful perinatal mental health podcast with a wonderful, wonderful uh, interviewer. Um, and she said, well, start here. Mm-hmm. Here's where to start with. And so that's another thing, you know, you can say to people who ask you for advice on something that, well, here, here are the references I first used. Mm -hmm. um, so, or maybe team up with some, with, with some people who you really like to work with. And so right. that the burden doesn't only fall on you. Yeah. I think I may be talking myself into starting a podcast. That's another story. Go with that. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, Russ, I, I saw your comment. I love interviewing people. Oh, and you're so good at it. You've interviewed me and and you can put it on your Instagram or Facebook even. It doesn't have to be at the level of a podcast. It can be, hey, like uh, so my friend Russ, who's here and, and he's shared some of his stuff in chat. He walked to Chicago from Florida last year, a thousand miles over the, the period of several months. And it was part of his mission called Heart Walking, which is so much of what, what he does as, as a music minister and a yoga teacher. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he did interviews with Keith Bull along the way. And it was just- a, and, a really and next time you do it, you'll, I'll take you out to coffee since I'm in Chicago. Yeah, and he See, just hashtag- that works. Just hashtag <laughs> walk, walk to Chicago. So yeah, walk check- Walk to Chicago West. and I'm here. <laughs> yeah, so so it was it was great. So here's the funny thing about maybe we're so, so this is a good transition now to the last piece of this where we're talking about what are your blocks? Like what is blocking you from putting yourself out there in the way you may want to be? And for a lot of you it is more mental emotional, like self-doubt. People don't want to hear what I have to say. Uh, Russ has an interesting comment here. My blocks come from, I cannot get all of my ideas out there. I cannot get all of my content on there. <gasps> That's the curse of perfectionism, which I can suffer with sometimes. If I can't do all of it exactly the way it's supposed to be, then I, I'm just not gonna do it at all. That's why perfectionism has been identified as one of the greatest causes of procrastination, that that, that block is what can exist. So uh, yeah, like Mara, Mara is saying here, like one slice at a time, one step at a time, if, if you're using the walking metaphor. Uh, so yeah, start to start to be like chewing on, on some of your blocks here. And, and some of the blocks may be technical. Like Kelly says here, organization is, is my challenge and, and focus. 
And uh, this is where like, I know I do have an advantage to getting so much done that I do have, well, I shouldn't say I'm a, I'm good at organizing in a lot of ways. And in a lot of other ways, I'm glad I have people like Mary and folks I can, I can delegate to. And, and I gave you that shout out, and this may be an idea for some of you, that the whole way my YouTube presence built was because I had a student who was willing to do it as her internship for me. And so another tip I can give based on that, and I've advised this to other people, is the communications departments at universities. Are you hearing me? You can't hear me? Oh, might be me. Is everyone else hearing me? Just give me a thumbs up. Okay. That may be the AirPods. Okay. Uh, a lot of students in communications departments need social media internships or how to kind of build a social media presence or brand. So, and, and they'll work either for free or very low cost. So you may consider reaching out to the communications department in the university in your area saying, hey, do you have students you need to place for internship? It would be helpful if you have at least some kind of business established, like I'm, you know, Heart Walk and Productions or I'm the, this, this equine center somewhere uh, uh, that, that would probably give the university a little more likelihood to place them. Uh, it, it worked for me. I'm not going to promise it's going to work for all of you, but it definitely worked for me to help build that initial YouTube uh, presence. So uh, one thing I will reflect on the whole podcast versus other content thing. Uh, another channel that I have used this year is the Facebook Livecast, because some of you have seen the interviews that I've done on the Mindful Ohio page for, because uh, I do love interviewing people and I love being interviewed which is part of why I haven't totally let the podcast idea go. And one of the reasons I like to be interviewed is I would much rather answer questions than be on a video and just kind of talk, for, which is why I love having Mara come in so we can have a little bit of interplay with each other. So if you know you, you're a good interviewer, podcasting could be the way to do it, but you might consider starting by doing some Facebook live casts where you interview people through Zoom because Zoom has, if you have a professional level Zoom account, you can learn how to bounce things over to, to Facebook. And that's a way you can get kind of the, the, the double interviews up there. So uh, I know for me, YouTube has felt more important than doing a podcast because so much of where YouTube has worked for me is because of the power of visual demonstration with actually doing EMDR videos, right? And I love film. I, I think I mentioned in this that I wanted to go to film school when I was younger. I'm kind of a tortured want to be filmmaker. And even my own personal therapist said, you doing videos and having a YouTube presence is a way you're, you're speaking to that part of yourself. And, and I love it. And I've never felt as jazzed about editing a podcast. The couple times I, 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 I had a, a brief podcast series with another friend of mine and it just didn't fuel me as much. So this is part of what is meant by the time to energy ratio. I do like interviewing people for Facebook Live and I get good, good feedback there. We did an entire uh, Black Lives Matter series earlier this year, which we're still adding to, uh, interviewing people like Dr. Kelly and, and other clinicians of color or from marginalized backgrounds. And I'm really happy to have that content out there. And then we end up sharing that on, on YouTube. But part of why I do that is I really enjoy doing it. And if these avenues we're talking about feel like they end up creating more work for you and you're going to resent it, because I would feel a podcast would quickly become that for me if I started my own, but I don't know, I'm still chewing on it. I'm potentially thinking of launching Redefine Therapy, our blog, and using that title as a podcast on as, as an ICM podcast, as opposed to Jamie Marriage. So we'll see what unfolds for it. All right, so let's transition now to talking or identifying blocks. And if you're willing to share your blocks with us on chat, uh, it's, it's a way to, to promote, I think, some more of this interaction and networking that, that we've cultivated throughout the day today. So sometimes the block 
can be, uh, Jill, I had announced at the beginning, I'm not doing a formal break. You can just take a break on, on your own here because uh, yeah, and then go back on the recording later. Sometimes the blocks are technical. Like I'm not a very good organizer. I'm not a very good editor. I'm not a very good this, that, or the other. And, and yes, the, the recording, I'll, I'll speak to that at the end where you can access the recording and it's available indefinitely on Facebook. If your block is technical, best advice or best experience strength and hope i can give you is a either hire somebody but if the, the money is an issue you can consider like we talked about potentially seeing if somebody can intern for you who has this skill set it can also be looking up a lot of how-to articles and how-to demos on YouTube, <laughs> talking about YouTube. When the world changed back in March and we suddenly had to transition everything over to Zoom, Mary and I taught each other everything we know from reading support articles and watching videos. Did it take time? Yes. Did we wish we would rather be doing something else with that time? Yes. But are we now able to kind of fluently run a business on Zoom? Yeah. And so a lot of times, because Mary, uh, my COO, she also has a consulting business on the side where she helps people with technical content. She'll often say, you can save money from me by looking these support articles up yourself or doing these, these how-to videos on, your, on yourself. And yes, for some people, that's not your ultimate learning style. So you may have to hire somebody or have somebody walk you through it. But if your block is technical, maybe that's the intention you set for yourself after this workshop, that I will work what I need to do in the way of skills to, to be able to get my work out there in the world. Uh, so this is another one, which I, I relate to. I fear being seen as crazy, losing out on being professional or that people would pity me. I want to be expressive in art and be a researcher, educator, growth facilitator. Uh, I want to be the whole of me. Yeah. And it, it, is, it is a dance. It is a balance between, and, and, and because I know the person who put out this comment, I, I will say baby steps, just like Mara gave Russ the advice in chat, baby steps that sometimes we can get so caught up in, I want it all out there right now. It's, it's the curse of perfectionism. And I think the same with authenticity and being the fullness of you. I have come out in baby steps about the fullness of my story. So what I'm giving you here is merely suggestion. It's not meant to be professional therapy or even professional consultation. I'm just kind of resonating with some of the blocks that, that people are giving me and, and giving some of my own experience, strength and hope. Uh, the other thing is if you are engaged in professional therapy, if you have a therapist, if you have a body worker, if you have a yoga teacher, if you have somebody you work with, tell them these things. Almost every professional drama I've dealt with, I talk to my therapist about. And we end up figuring out what it's really about. Like several years back, I had such a block with money. And a lot of us do, especially when you've grown up in a traumatic situation with parents with money issues or family members with money issues. If you're an EMDR, they're EMDR that stuff. If you receive yoga therapy, have somebody do yoga therapy on that stuff. The blocks can be worked through. True story, I used to be in a place, God, I didn't think I was gonna share this today, but alas, here I am. Anytime I would run a training and somebody would cancel a registration that I had to refund, I would feel like, oh, I'm not gonna be able to pay my, my mortgage next month. I mean, it was such a ridiculous jump my head went to, even though I had already been established that people were signing up for trainings. And 
I don't want to impugn those of you who may be just starting out where every little registration matters, but I EMDR'd it and it went back to two real issues with both of my parents that were separate issues, but the perfect storm of them together just gave me all kind of hangups over money. And I don't think I would have cleared the path to have a lot of these attitudes I've projected today about trusting the process if I didn't do some personal therapy on those blocks. Block, I'm introverted and could get easily overwhelmed with too much interaction. Yeah, thanks Anita for, for bringing that up. My best recommendation that I would give to that is make sure you have a good grounding plan in place. And even as somebody who is very extroverted and loves having conversations and, and put, puts myself out there pretty regularly, if I'm not grounded, it ends up scrambling my head. It really does, especially because I have some dissociative issues. So for instance, when I go to teach a course in person or when I'm here on Zoom doing things, I have to be early. I, I do not get people who come in right on the wire and just start teaching. Being early helps me to get grounded, helps me to make sure I'm, I have my incense lit here in my room when I'm teaching. So what is your grounding plan? I would say that's important whether you're introverted or extroverted, but it's especially important if you're introverted. It's especially important if you might struggle with, with dissociative issues. Uh, so Kelly, uh, the block here, fear of not sustaining the energy to see all the projects through to the end. I hear that and think of the, the, the step at a time logic that Mara and I have both talked about today, the, the step at a time. And sometimes this is, this is the beauty of intention, that a project you think you need to see through to the end ends up turning into something else. And if you are so worried about outcome, it may not unfold the way it is supposed to. Uh, Russ, to your uh, practical question, do you have a webcam? <laughs> What's in my laptop? I, I don't use anything more sophisticated than that. I do have a better microphone that I hook to the laptop. I have professional lighting in here, <clears throat> but I have a Mac and I use the, uh, the webcam that's in the Mac. Um, I, Mara, go ahead, Mara. Mara, I'll bring you in at the end one more time to talk about techniques. I just want to get through some of the blocks here. Uh, fear of rejection. <laughs> Join the club, right? I don't mean to impugn that, Roshan, because God knows fear of rejection, fear of failure. I think those are the recovery addicts, two worst fears, right? So my answer to that is how are you using your recovery program, whether it be a 12-step program, your yoga practice, if you practice yoga nidra regularly, set an intention around things like rejection or failure. Or if you receive trauma therapy or yoga therapy, consider working through that. And sometimes what I find is useful is to use this mental strategy. What is the worst thing that can happen if I get rejected in this situation? What's the worst thing that can happen if Brene Brown never answers my email back? Yeah, I know if, if it's little me I'm talking to, it's like, oh, she doesn't like me. She doesn't like me. But then it's like, okay, take a breath, listen to your whole self. My life's not going to be any different, at least, you know? So I think with my block, I'm now wholly ready. And so the blocks seem like the old stuff I don't need anymore, but haven't known how to give up. Yep. EMDR, whatever therapy you're doing can be great for those blocks. Mara agrees so much with this. We can overinterpret other people's actions as being personal in some way. Uh, a potential concern that something I put out there becomes outdated, clinically contraindicated, and causes a legal issue. Uh, I know that fear. Do some work around it. One of two things. If you're like, because I, I hear this block come up a lot. I don't want somebody to read my book and then go out and kill themselves. Or I don't want somebody to read my book and then, you know, get this clinical piece of advice and then it completely goes against what their doctor says. And then what if they end up harming someone else? Could I be made responsible? 
I'm going to give you two pieces of advice on that. One is practical, one is clinical. If you are really that worried, hire a lawyer. I've recently upped my legal game this year because as my reputation has grown, I've had some of the same concerns. Like, oh my gosh, can I be liable in this situation or, or whatnot? And usually there are different kinds of lawyers, to be clear, just like there are different types of therapists and healers and some are very fear mongering, but I, I've found a legal advisor right now who has a nice balanced view of the two and saying things like if you preface things like in my clinical opinion you're generally generally in the clear as opposed to like this is absolutely how it is uh similar and then the other block can be work with a trauma therapist over what the origin of that block is so case in point i had a student once who was so afraid to do emdr after learning it, did well with it in practicum because she was so afraid that, well, what if a client of mine ends up committing suicide? That was the, the worry. And, and, and it just seemed so out of proportion because that's a risk we always deal with as clinicians, right? And it traced back to something a psychiatrist told her. Like if, if, you, if you have clients get too emotional, they may commit suicide. So no wonder she was afraid to practice. So I advise she get some of her own EMDR trauma work around uh, that block. Uh, similar to that, somebody who's very close to me said his big worry was how to deal with haters in comment sections, in people who criticize. Oh, if you have haters, it means you've arrived. That's, that's the best kind of I could give you. And, and it's just like with, with everything else, uh, do your work around it and, and look at it as, as an opportunity. So I'm, I'm looking, looking here too. Mara's answered a, a lot of these. Uh, when I feel I'm ready to launch anything new, I discover a new piece of information and feel I have to incorporate it. And then another, and then another, this was Francine Shapiro's problem. I understand that anytime somebody criticized her on something, it's like, well, let me add it to the book. Let me add it to the book. Let me add it to the book. Same thing. Get out what you know now. You know, get, get out what you know now. <laughs> somebody said, don't hire Giuliani for legal. I'm, I'm right with you on that piece of recommendation. And then we just get a lot of, I'm afraid to take the leap. That hesitation paralyzes me and, and leaves me not taking the leap. Yeah. So uh, once more, if fear is, is in any way your answer here, fear of rejection, fear of failure, fear of not being good enough, fear of people not liking me, fear of people holding you responsible, fear, fear, fear. I know most of you, not most of you, but I know a lot of you on this call, you work in professions or have access to people who can help you with this if fear is the block. So do that work. I really believe you're worth it. So Mara, I wanna have you come in and talk a little bit more about blocks and then we'll answer uh, some of these kind of lingering technical questions we've gotten about things like lighting and computers and because mm -hmm. uh, I do need to wrap us up as advertised around three. So Mara, how do we, how do we work through our blocks? How have you worked through your blocks? Therapy helps. Therapy helps a lot. Um, finding community helps a lot. Uh, listening to what people ask you to do, doing it, and then having conversations about it helps a lot. Um, being willing to take feedback helps a lot. And a lot of what I'm seeing coming up over and over again is the leap. You know, it, the, the, a, a sense it comes from that perfectionism also of all or nothing. And remember, the first thing you do doesn't have to be the last thing you do. Mm -hmm. So you start, right? You start the conversation and with the idea that it, it will continually evolve. You know, it's funny, the first advanced practice workshop that I designed for MDRIA, for MDR and perinatal mental health, I envisioned it as a one day workshop, which I never taught in that format. Then I proposed it as a two day workshop and taught that twice. And it is now a three day workshop. And it's like, right, because the more I talk to people about it, the more I got my stuff together, the more I realized like, now, wait a minute, 
I could offer it like this and and people are saying yes. So let's let's see how that goes. So if you can think about that you don't you don't start by you know doing the the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. You start. It 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 builds on itself. Yes. And that's really it's important to remember that. And I want to say again about writing and I said this in the chat for I have some writer friends whose first drafts I think are magnificent and I hate them deeply as I love them deeply. <laughs> but every from every bit of writing is rewriting. And I think about it a lot like pouring sand in a sandbox. You have to get the material in the sandbox. You have to get some words and ideas on paper. Don't edit while you write. I'm speaking to myself as much as I am speaking to you just blah, blur, blurb the words on paper and then start to, to, to play with them. And you may find that what you've put out on paper isn't one blog post. Really, it's probably five blog posts or maybe even 10 mm -hmm. smaller bites. Smaller bites are more manageable for you, but they're also more manageable for the reader when it comes to things like that. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so think about, for example, I'm, I'm in the process of building a demo library for EMDR and perinatal mental health. Um, and it occurred to me along the similar along similar lines that not every demo I do needs to be all eight phases. Mm -hmm. I could ask people, would you like to do a demo on this bit or this bit, you know, and things like that. And like, oh, you know what? That actually feels much more attainable to not just say, I want to build or I'm in the process of building, but like actually be accelerating in that process. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the other thing that I will say is ask for help. Yes, Otter is incredible, isn't it, Jamie? Mm -hmm. um, ask for help, whether it's crowdsourcing an idea for something technological. Hey, what do you guys use? Do you have you found? We can't find a blah, blah that we love. Honestly, I can't find a scheduler that doesn't make me and my operations manager go, what were, what were they thinking? Mm -hmm. Or what were they, why were they not thinking? It's silly. So ask. And also, when you're doing a big project, you're not going to be good at everything. At first, you may need to learn enough about all the pieces of what to do to get better at it. But mm -hmm. as you grow, because remember, it's a process. It is OK. And if you struggle with this, this is good, you know, this is good material for therapy or conversations with peers mm -hmm. um, to say, what would it mean to me to say, I'm not good at this? Um, maybe it's a good time to get some freelance help with with those things mm -hmm. because the amount of time and energy sunk into trying to do some of these things yourself at, at a certain point doesn't help you and absolutely drains you and mara just i think you know i feel this way so i hope you don't mind me saying this publicly when you hired somebody it, it just created the world of difference. Didn't it make a total difference? You were able to focus more on what you do. Absolutely. And I was absolutely drowning. Mm -hmm. And I was I was running so fast that I kept dropping things. Now, I, that, right before I hired my operations manager, I had literally booked myself to, to two places to stay for a training I was taking <laughs> and into the wrong hotel. For that I was where I was sharing a room with somebody mm -hmm. for a training where for a conference where I was speaking mm -hmm. and almost did it a third time and thought, I, I do believe I've hit my limit. Yeah. Yeah. I do believe. And so yeah, I I, I very quickly things evened out. And it has been it changed my life because I could also breathe and like you said, focus on what I am good at. Yep. Wonderful. So Rafi says here, it's a process. Apple did not invent the iPhone 12 on its first launch. Exactly. Really good practical example, whether you like the Apple company or not. Yeah. What we have now in the way of technology is not what, what we, we had initially. And, and the thing about like, if you feel you don't have the cash flow to hire, so like, I get that. I was in that position where I first started out, like every little bit of money I was making had to go to, to sustain the level of business. So while I think you have to be conscious about not taking advantage of people, you may have some people in your circles who are willing to volunteer, especially yoga folks. 
Uh, you may, I, I mentioned the intern route, uh, talking to the communications department at, at your school. The problem with doing college interns, I will say this because I've done this a lot, is there's a lot of turnover because they usually only need the work for like nine months or the year. So when I first hired an administrative assistant, it was a, a first it was one of my friends and then it was a, a college student who was working on her graduate degree and she's now a professional in the field. So uh, yeah, I only had her as an assistant for a while, you know, and, and, and I mean, I, this is getting a little uh, technical to talk about like, what did you pay them, et cetera. I, I mean, I, I try to practice what I preach and do living wage. So, but I also do a lot of, uh, yeah, like Mara said, it could depend on the region. Uh, so I definitely pay above minimum wage, but something that would be considered fair for your area. Um, and I also do some bartering with people if that feels organic to you. Like I'll, if you take one of, if you want to take one of my trainings uh, and, and you're not really like in the counseling world, it's not considered cool to barter counseling services, but there's no problem I see in bartering training or consultation in exchange for providing some kind of service. So yeah, I've, I've done the barter quite a bit. So well, good, good tech. If you have technical questions about things like lighting and sound, et cetera, et cetera, I, I best advise you just spend some time on Google. Remember what I said when I started this talk that my early venture into doing organic networking was really just spending a lot of time on Google, looking things up, looking up places that I could reach out to to contact. So the same thing with, with desk microphones and desk camera and desk lights, see how things review well. Uh, the microphone I use is called Blue Snowball. Uh, it's, there's also Yeti is, is really good. Sometimes, especially if I facilitate movement, I'll use AirPods or, or things of that nature. And I just have a, a ring light. Like ring light is, is I think it's the brand or the, or the type of product. As, the key is as long as you're front lit. That, that's important. And you could do how-to tutorials on YouTube about how to shoot good video with simply uh, a webcam. So yeah, with a lot of those technical issues, spend some of your time, especially if you know you want to have more of a web presence. I, I do think it's worth putting the money into it. So Mara, I want to thank you so, so much. This was fun having you with me today for this process. Do it. Thank any, you. any final words you want to give our attendees? I know a lot of people uh, bounced out of here a few minutes ago, but any final words for our folks who are still with us? Uh, just that it's really, it's, I'm really glad you're here. And I'm really glad you're thinking about this and talking about this. And that's really how it gets rolling. And, you know, believe in that spark inside of you because it's real. Um, and remember that you get to have time to develop how you do what you do and to try things. And some of those things will fall flat and it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. I agree. Uh, I've had a lot of things fall flat. And part of my like, really spiritual orientation on it is those things weren't meant to work out. Mm -hmm. or, or I learned a very valuable lesson from that thing falling flat that helped me do differently next time. Yeah, and maybe the timing wasn't right. Maybe next time it comes around, you'll be in a different place to yep. engage it. Yep. So for those of you wanting to know where you can get a recording of this presentation in the chat, I just put up the recording that will be online on a website, but give me about 24 hours to get that on there. If you follow me on Facebook, Uh, at, at least if you follow Mindful Ohio and the Institute for Creative Mindfulness, the live stream will be there indefinitely. So this is a, a workshop that I did. Often what I like to do when I test out a new workshop idea is offer the content for free first, just to see how it feels for me to teach it, to see how it feels for you to receive it. Uh, at some point, I might do more professional work in this area, but for right now, this first version of the workshop will be out there because I wanted my team to be able to watch this later too, because I just get these questions a lot. So I thought having a place where we can keep it up as a video once more, I don't promise, I'm definitely not an expert marketing consultant, 
Uh, I wouldn't even consider myself an expert networking consultant. But if you follow the advice that an expert is somebody who has made lots of mistakes and has lived to tell the tale, then I guess I have expertise in this area. So I was happy to offer that today. Yay, thank you for inviting me, Jamie. This was super fun. You're so welcome.